Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring books, books, books. Thank you so much to our anonymous series sponsor, who really is an old friend and sponsored this entire series just for those initial love for those who introduced him to books. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas. So be sure to check out 1840.org. That's 18FORTY.org. You can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. I don't think there is a characteristic that writers struggle with more than imposter syndrome. I, I don't know if it's just me. I, I Every writer I speak to uh, immediately says the issue that they're always, you know, grappling with is like, I, 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 do I really have what it takes? Do I really have the the magic to write something? I think the reason why writing is so prone to imposter syndrome is that really anyone can write. You don't need a fancy degree. You know, imposter syndrome, I'm sure, is in other fields. It's in law, I'm sure. It's in medicine. But at the end of the day, if you're a doctor, you know you had to go to school to uh, you know, finish, get licensed, and now you're a doctor. So now you might feel like, oh, who am I to do this? Sure, sure, there's some imposter syndrome, but there is something unique about the imposter syndrome that I, that I see, that I hear, and that I feel personally among people who write, like in the creative world. When you're doing something creatively, there's no licensing for it. There's nobody who kind of says, you know what, you, you are creative, you should be writing, you should be doing this. And really, throughout your life, you kind of grapple with this voice of like, you just feel like you're reaching into this bag to pull out something. The bag's empty and just miraculously, you're hoping that something appears. Like there's this really famous story with Reb Shaila. It's the only Reb Shaila Hasidic story that I know. And I heard it once from Moshe Weinberger, where he said that he would give out these bilkalas, which is a, the Yiddish word for a challah roll. And he would kind of give out these challah rolls to everybody uh, who came. And, uh, and they came and they checked. He's handing out challah rolls. And they checked and, and they looked and the bag was totally empty. He's giving it out to all these poor people, all these challah rolls, uh, so they have what to eat. And they looked at it, and the, the, the bag was totally empty. It was miraculous. And I remember when I heard this, it was through the interpretation of Moshe Weinberger and giving over the story, that he said that a lot of times, this is how we feel, that you're kind of reaching into this bag, and it's, it's empty, and you're staring at a blank screen. You don't know what's going to be there, and you just hope that you find something. You're able to pull something out to give something, to uplift. I feel it every week when I sit down to record a podcast. I would sit it down. I said I, I had that feeling when I sit down to write a, a column or an article. And I think the person who really both opened the door to not not just the feelings of being a writer, but but this life of trying to uplift people through words and all of the difficulty and all of the angst that, that I've had to deal with, but also all of the comfort and validation that I've ever looked for. Uh, is our guest today, and that is our dearest friend, Srili Besser. Uh, Srili Besser, Yisroel Besser is what he writes under, is an incredible person, and if you've never heard of him, you've never read any of your of his books, uh, you should definitely go and find uh, all of them now. We're going to recommend a bunch of them uh, over the course of, of the conversation. But I want to tell you what, what he means to me, because it is something uh, really, really uh, personal. And in many ways, I feel like so much of what I'm able to do today is a credit to his enthusiasm and encouragement and guidance uh, in this world. Uh, please only credit him with the good stuff. Uh, when I mess up, uh, it has nothing to do with Surly. I'm not on the phone with him, uh, gaming out uh, all of my mispronunciations, all of the guests that people have that they take issue with. None of that has to do with Surly. Uh But the encouragement really has to do with really because when you're in this field, when you're in the world of creative output, whether it's you're giving classes or you're writing or you're, I don't know, you have a podcast of your own, it does feel sometimes like you're reaching into an empty bag and the people who really give you the confidence and encouragement to keep reaching out and pulling something out are the people in my life like the Srilly Bessers. Uh, there was a time not so long ago where I thought I had already achieved something because I had a 
semi-popular Twitter account. Uh, I I used to tweet a lot of Twitters on the on the fritz right now with its competition threads. I'm not leaving Twitter so fast. Uh, it's a different conversation. But I I remember I you know I had this Twitter Twitter account and I would make jokes and you know it built up a, a semi reasonable following, a few thousand followers. I honestly wasn't huge. It wasn't a huge community, but people got a kick out of it. And I remember that. I was invited through my dearest friend, uh, Menachem Butler, who really, if you trace back to nearly every professional success or new step, a new doorway that I walked through, could, could really in some way be traced to his encouragement and my friendship with him. Really, my first published articles were with uh, Menachem Butler. Menachem Butler invited me to this event, uh, which was a mixer. Not, not a mixer, that's not the right word. It was like a networking event. That's probably the right word. Mixers for dating. It was not a dating event. There was a, it was an event at Mishpacha magazines, you know, gathering where they were inviting Jewish thinkers, Jewish people, and I should not have been in that room. Uh, the thing I remember best is that I was not dressed appropriately for the Mishpacha nighttime event. Mishpacha is a weekly magazine that caters really broadly in the Orthodox community, maybe skews a little bit in the Yeshiva community, in the Hasidic community. Um, but they have a magazine, and they had this networking event that my friend Menachem Butler uh, invited me to. And the thing that I remember uh, is I hated it. Uh, I don't hate Mishpacha Magazine, uh, but I, I hated the event. It was not for me. I was not dressed properly. I think I was wearing black jeans. I was at that stage in my life. You know, you're going through something. If you're wearing a pair of black jeans and a sports jacket, I'm trying to be something that I very much uh, was not. And I walked in there, nobody knew or cared uh, who I was, which I'm more or less fine with, except at a networking event, it really highlights the fact that like, hey, you know, I was, a, I was younger, I was a kid, and it was just like, I don't know, these networking events feel like a several hour reminder that you're not that important. And I was just like, I don't know, I sat on the side and had some, I don't know, sushi, you know, sushi or whatever it was. And I was waiting to leave, and we finally left. At the very, very end, Menachem asked, he said, hey, do you have a copy of your Hebrew Sefer? I wrote a Hebrew Sefer. You can actually find it on hebrewbooks.org. It's called Berogez Rachig Tizkor. I wrote it in memory of my four uh, grandparents and published it uh, a little bit after I got married. My grandfather died right before I got engaged. I got married. Uh, my grandfather died in February. got married in uh, <laughs> June, I know when my anniversary is, I got married in June, and uh, and then I wrote the Safer and published it. It was not a, whatever the opposite of a bestseller is, uh, is exactly what this book was. I Menachem asked me, do you have a copy? I, I did have a copy with me, and I inscribed it and gave it to uh, this truly bestseller who I never met before and only vaguely heard of before. And it was a couple weeks later that uh, Surly actually came to my house. We, we schmoozed. He didn't even know what I did. He thought I was a lawyer, probably because of the black jeans I was wearing, you know, trying to look like sleek, like a cool businessman. Uh, I was nothing of the sort. He was kind of taken off guard. He's like, wait, well, you're an educator? Well, what, what, what's your story exactly? And he wrote a, a short column about me in Mishpacha magazine that I was very grateful for. And then uh, a few months later, he reached out to me and said, hey, we're looking for new writers uh, in Mishpacha, and we we're thinking may may maybe you'd be a good fit for this. Why, why don't you come in and talk more to our to our office and 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 get involved? And that began a a several year journey where I was writing this column called Top Five, which was a list of uh, like cute little lists in the Jewish community of the different characters and idiosyncrasies that take place in the Jewish community. I eventually published it in a book, which I actually think the publisher just reached out to me and said he's going to put it on sale. They have some sitting in the warehouse still. It actually sold half decently. Uh, the book is called Top 5 Lists of Jewish Character and Characters. You should wait for it to go on sale. It was published by uh, Israel Bookshop. Israel Bookshop Publications, uh, I think they're going to be running a big sale of the book. I'm extraordinarily proud of the book, and I was really proud of of the column again it was called top five i'm just like reading now from you know past columns i did top five shabbos table staples top five like the food you eat top five shabbos table dips um some of the more popular columns top five uniquely jewish words top five 
Latin words that Jews love to use, top five Jewish noises, top five wordless communications. I think the column that I was most proud of because you know, it was a humor column, which, A, it's impossible to write a humor column. It's much harder to write a humor column than to write an, I don't know, an academic biography. When people ever, I, I always took offense when people would call the column cute. Like I said, I don't know if cute is the right word. Um, you could say you enjoyed it or that you found it funny or not funny. It's definitely not cute because it was really, really hard to write. I would sit every Sunday. The column was due Sunday night. I would sit Sunday morning. And I would write the article, and a lot of times I would be staring at a, at, at a blank screen, and it was terrifying. And Srilly, throughout this entire process, was my editor. I think the column I was about to say that I love most, and I'm not just saying it because it's during the three weeks, but it was the column that I feel like I arrived at that I was able to both be humorous about something serious while also be educational. And that was top five morning practices that we should shelve, where I spoke a little bit, wrote a little bit, about some of the morning practices that that I was like, you know, this isn't the way to do it. I, I had a, a little bit over there about the chairs that people use on Tisha B'Av, on the 9th of Av, when we mourn the Beis Hamigdash. And I wrote, the column opens up, excuse me, pardon me, so sorry, coming through. The lights in the shul are dimmed, except for a few of the old timers who are unable. Everyone is sitting on the floor. But there's always one guy who arrives on Tisha B'Av night with some inflatable couch or lawn chair who begins setting up for Eicha like he's tanning on a beach. I totally get it. Sitting on the floor can be genuinely too physically straining, but we need to establish some ground rules. If the chair you bring to Shul on Tisha B'av makes that squishy plastic sound every time you fidget, maybe you need to find something quieter to sit on. And if it has, <laughs> and if it has cup holders and a palm tree emblazoned on the back, Maybe it's best to be used in sandier locales. Sorry, I'm laughing at my own my own column, but it's a good rule of thumb. If your chair that you bring to shul on Tisha B'av, where where the custom is that we sit on the floor on Tisha B'av when they read Eicha Lamentations, it is a night of seriousness. So people bring in their own chairs. You know, the old old school uh, crowd will remember people would sit on on milk cartons that would leave kind of these like marks. Uh, on your on on your backside and on your feet, sometimes they bring little tykes chairs. But a good rule of thumb is that if the chair you're bringing in uh, has cup holders, uh, it is probably not appropriate uh, for for Tisha B'av. And I remember, like, I wrote this column. I remember where I was when I wrote this column, and I felt a sense of like arrival that like I had this mentor, a uh, Sruli Besser, who has this incredible way of looking and seeing the Jewish community, seeing its idiosyncrasies, seeing some of the things that you maybe roll your eyes at, and taking those feelings of cynicism, and instead of, of yelling and pointing and getting angry, being able to bring a smile and even being able to inspire. And surely, uh, even since his work with Mishpacha Magazine has become a prolific biographer, the biographer, the biographies, to me at least, uh, that have really resonated his biography on Rip Shlomo Freifeld and his biography on Rip Mayer's Lottowitz, but he's written so many more uh, that, of course, we will link to and you want to check out online. Uh, and he's also written the best-selling Haggadah. He wrote the Rev. Milo's Biederman Haggadah uh, that was actually sponsored uh, by by a dear friend, Evan Goldenberg, who's, uh, who's a Yadid, who's really somebody I've known for a long time, and he's he, he supported our work. Really an incredible person. Anyways, Srili is, uh, is really somebody special, but to me, more than anybody else, he's the person who kind of took me from relative obscurity and gave me a microphone and gave me a platform and said, you have something to offer to the wider world. And to me, it is the most enduring chesed anybody can do. Everybody is insecure uh, in their 20s, in their early career, uh, especially people who aspire to write and to share ideas. You need platforms to connect to. You can't just start your own and assume people are... You first need to, to connect to something larger and hopefully build a name and a reputation for yourself. And the person who did that for me uh, was really Besser. And really from the bottom of my heart, and I think him in person... Um, I have such a debt of gratitude um, for him kind of looking at me. I was a young kid tweeting, you know, writing here and there, and he saw something. He saw something 
and he pulled me aside. And, and I'm telling you this really for two reasons. Number one, because it's the only way I can introduce him is through the lens of, of deep, real gratitude. I, I look at everything that I am doing now, uh, even though I'm no longer writing in Mishpacha magazine, but learning how to build an audience and your responsibility to the audience, learning how to be you know, critical but inspiring, how to see the world and share the world uh, through uplifting eyes, uh, is something that I continue to do today, and I learned, really, I strive to do today, and I only learned how to do this really through Srili. He's the one who, who nurtured and, and taught me how to see and share the world in this way, uh, and gave me that chesed and pulling me out and saying, hey, you can really do this. But even more than that, uh, the reason why I'm sharing it is not just because Srili is the guest, is it's for you, our listeners. I think there is no greater chesed in the world than to take somebody who is young and who is starting out and pull them aside and say, you, you really have something here. You have something to offer. Keep this up. Keep at it. How can I help you? The greatest chesed that you can do, the greatest kindness that you can do is making somebody feel like they are worthwhile. Um, even people who are accomplishing, even people who are putting themselves out there uh, probably all feel like they are reaching into that empty bag, hoping that a hollow roll uh, mysteriously appears. And to give somebody the encouragement to keep reaching down, to keep trying, to keep at it, uh, particularly people who are in the world of any creative space, and I'm including educators, rabbis, young educators, to tell a young teacher, you really have something, you really have something remarkable um, and give them their next opportunity or give them encouragement in their current opportunity uh, is a kindness that I think particularly now during the three weeks when we think of division, when we think of what separates us and the destruction of the temple of the Beis HaMikdash, which really was founded on the divisiveness within our community, I think one way to have unity without the platitude of unity uh, is to pull somebody out from the crowd and say, you're really doing something special here. You're doing something really amazing here, particularly young people uh, who really struggle. I remember this, and you know, I still have it now, just because I'm, uh, I'm like I have anxiety coursing through my veins at all times. But, but particularly for young people who've never had any of that validation yet, they're giving their first local, I don't know, class in a in a synagogue in a shul. That's a first year teacher. Uh, didn't go as well as they planned or expected or imagined or dreamed and pulling them aside and saying, you're really doing something special here. It's what Srili did for me, and I'm sharing it because I hope that people find people within their own lives, within their own orbit, who they could pull aside and be a Srili Besser to, and say, you're really doing something. You keep this up, and you can do something great. You can do something amazing. We have a very easy time sharing our criticism, our critiques, how to be better, where you stepped over the line, where you didn't do well, um, and that's all fine, and that's all important. But ask yourself, when was the last time I pulled somebody over and said, more of this, you, you are fantastic, and you can be doing more of this. And he did that for me, and I am legitimately forever indebted for that early encouragement in my life that still propels me and still animates the work that I do. Uh, and I hope that our listeners and listening to this interview can find somebody else uh, in their life that they could kind of pull over and uplift. I do want to make a note before we get to the interview, uh, an apology. Uh, I set up the recording. We recorded in person. I, I needed to see Srili in person because I almost never get to see him. He doesn't live in the tri-state area, something we also discussed. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted to talk to him in person. However, I kind of messed up my side of the audio, which our audio engineer was able to fix a little bit. Uh, it's still You're still able to uh, obviously listen and hear it, uh, but I did want to apologize that the quality of the audio, which we really take seriously, uh, because I was the one who really set this up. I kind of botched it. Uh, the setting was on too high. So my sincerest apologies. But without further ado, uh, really, I am so excited and really with just a great sense of gratitude, our conversation with my dearest friend, Srili Besser. I am very excited. It is there's a strangeness to sit across from like a friend, uh, somebody who's been a mentor, uh, somebody who's really given me feedback, guidance. Uh, certainly doesn't always agree with things that I do, but is always really a uh, what is what the Ramban said about the Ibn Ezra, a 
Tochacha Magula of Ahava Mesuteras, a kind of an open rebuke with a, with a hidden love and somebody who's really been for me from the very, very beginning. Uh, Rab Surly, I really, really appreciate you sitting down to speak with me today. Yes, Mr. Pasha, I would just take issue with what you said. It's not, I don't think it's Ahava Mesuteras. I think it's Ahava Magula too. I don't, I don't, the, I don't the, love, the love, love, the love the, is secret. The love is open as well. I think sometimes, in fact, it's probably the biggest, the biggest definition of love, I think, is being able to be honest with people and say uh, that that's beneath you or... I, I would hope people do do the same for me, and I hope you would be one of those people as well. It, it's not a it's not a hidden love at all. You're you're uh, talented. Your your depth, your ability to communicate things, and your I think your genuine compassion, and and heart and empathy for for other yid and, and and what they're going through and what they're trying to become, I think leads you to do a lot of nice things. I think it comes with the territory when you're dealing with that type of thing. With uh, it's a very vulnerable area. So that's why I'm your friend. I, I yeah. can't tell you that I follow every single thing you do, but when I when I'm able, and I have a minute, I, I'm very I'm very uh, proud of being that friend in your life. Was able to tell you uh, it, do, it does it all. Yeah, <laughs> it, it does mean a lot to me. I want to kind of start from the beginning. We're talking about books, books, books. You have become really like an incredibly prolific author. You didn't begin as an author. You began, and I, I remember you once mentioned me in passing. You began as a rebbe. Can you tell me, why did you decide to leave, or when did you realize, oh, wow, I have a knack for writing, I'm going to leave my job, which has like a clear track, like, oh, I'm going to be like a Rebbe, and then maybe you'll become a principal, or a Menahel, or a Rav, or there's a clear track. When I told my father that I was going to start writing for Mishpacha magazine, I, I remember his face, he's my biggest fan now, but he made a cringy face, and he went like this, like, like, like full time, like it, it made him nervous. You, you you had a job and you left it to become a full time writer, which almost as a career does not exist, particularly in the Orthodox world. Why did you decide to do that? I would love to be able to get here and say something beautiful about by Nissen Wolfman, the editor of the Jewish Observer, all the years was a manal in, in Queens, and he asked Yaakov Kamenetsky about giving up chinuch, but that this was a full time job. Or Shower had this vision of starting a monthly orthodox periodical in English, which at the time was, was a bold move, but it was the future. It was a very wise move because that opened the door to you know, all those publications and, and the media platforms that followed. And he went to Byakov Kamenetsky. So Byakov told him, why would you want to teach 30 if you could teach 3,000 or whatever the numbers were? That means your influence could be so much bigger. I wish I could tell you that it was like a decision I made based on the ability to impact lives. Well, it wasn't. It's a thing that I, I'm sure a lot of people experience this. You grew up in a, in a, in a system and there's expectations of what's called success or a gauge or a socially imposed gauge of what's called success. If you're in yeshiva, if you're going to the yeshiva kailo track, to a lot of people being a rabbi is called a success. So you don't ever stop to think, is this something I want to do or not something I want to do? It's just something you see, I made it because I got, so I was learning kailo in Eretz Yisrael. My rabbi opened the kailo in Montreal. So it was an opportunity to learn by him. We moved back. To Montreal, which was never in my plans. I, I grew up in Montreal, but I, I was certain that I would live. And when I married my wife, who's from Muncie, I, I was certain that it was not something. Lakewood, Muncie. Lakewood, yeah. Muncie, I just roll. Those yeah. are my options, Brooklyn, whatever. I didn't yeah. see myself as somebody who could be, so to speak, confined to the small town. Yeah. But it came at an opportune time, and I just saw we were looking, you know, we had, we had two children already, and, and we were thinking that it was time to go back. And then it was this opportunity. It was just four of us to learn by him. So we said, we'll try it. And Baruch Hashem was very, one of the more special periods of my life. You know, we sat there for a few years. And then somebody came to me in, in Montreal, a friend of mine, and there was a Sephardic high school. And he was the Manal. And he said, we're looking for 10th grade Rebbe. Would you want to, you, you don't ever stop to think, do I want to? Because it becomes, about, am I going to get it? Because how many other applicants are there? Correct. Is my share going to be better than theirs, right? Your competitive nature or whatever just starts to kick in and you just want to get the job to show you can get the job. Yeah. So I hadn't, you know, it happened very fast. And I went in and I said, what's called a prabha, which is like a, a sample. Uh, yeah, sure, so try it. like it. And, and, you know, he came to me and said, that was pretty good. Would you come again? So again, you don't stop to think, do I really want to do this or not? You just, can I get this job? Can I prove to myself? And then I got the job. Later, that I found out that I was up against precisely zero other applicants. There weren't that many people who were excited about the job, I guess. And it was more hype, like to yeah. myself, am I going to get there? <laughs> of course, I got the job. Nobody else was going for it, uh, of course, you know. And I, I fell in love with the boys in the classroom 10th grade, uh, Sephardic boys from homes. It's very hard to classify Montreal Sephardic homes as either modern Orthodox or Haredi. They they knew very little in terms of background, but their hearts. I have never met an Ashkenaz boy, including my own children. May they may they be well. 
who have that kind of instinctive heart for anything holy, their instinctive reaction to, to sing a Sefer Torah, come into a room. Yeah. What you feel, what I felt yes. in that room, a Shabbos. They're just there, they, there was, words weren't even necessary. They were, yeah. they're, they're the Zika, they're, they're pull. They're, they were, they're, they're, sure. They were so drawn to holiness. And I, I, I fell in love with the job and I fell in love with the boys. It was completely not what I expected it to be. I was coming in with my shoe around Gittin, that I'm gonna tell them over, you know, like what I heard from Bashar Yeli from yeah. Nachum Pertavitz. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't that at all. It was uh, something very different. But I, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful time. And the, and the connections I made with the boys then, endure with some of the boys, I realized I hated the job. After, after about two or three months, I didn't like the administrative Two or three events. months. Yeah, I realized I, was, I wasn't happy because I loved the connection part of it. I hated, I hated the administrative parts of it, the report cards and the meetings and the schedule. I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. It was very hard. Why don't you do what a normal person would do and go into real estate, go into, meaning there, there needed to have been an opening that you asked, oh, I can write. How do you discover that you have a talent for writing? It's a little unfair. I never discovered it because I, First of all, I, I don't know if you know who my, my grandfather, Chaskel Basra, and my father, because on the shark, he's the rough now on my grandfather, Shalom the West Side, Shalom Basra. Their the writing is in a different league than anything I could ever aspire to. My grandfather was a magnificent writer. He wrote several languages. You know, he wrote Hebrew, Yiddish, English, German, Polish. He, he was a man of letters, a man of yeah. literature. You know, my grandmother, Shmigas on Stark, you go into the house down the west side, and you look at the books. You would go, you, you I particular. love a good shelfie. You have to just see what's going on in that house. In terms of my grandfather, knew uh, military history. So he had the complete, he, he knew everything. He knew literature. He knew um, my grandfather. At the end of his life, I was in his house. He was really not well already, and television was on, and he was watching the World Cup. It was a big thing that summer. And he, he said, could you put on the, the soccer game? And it was like interesting to me. He wasn't a big TV watcher. His, his loves were, he loved, if he liked culture, he loved music, classical music. Mm -hmm. Grandfather, you could put on a, a piece on the radio. And within 10 seconds, he would tell you not only the piece, he would tell you who's conducting. He, wow. You know, he, was, he was really, he really understood classical music. Plus, he was a person who said a Dafya Mishio his whole life without any, there were no aids in those days. There was yeah, no, he uh, wasn't. no apps and no art school and no anything. Yeah. He knew Truva. So he knew, he knew a tremendous amount. He was a Rav Rishol. Special. So he said to me, I'm watching the game. It was like Yugoslavia against uh, Czechoslovakia, whatever countries he goes. He goes, I'm watching because the way they play soccer is really mirrors their military strategy. It's exactly the same if you know their history. So the ones who are sneaky are sneaky on the court. And the ones who are much more clever, they're doing that. The ones who are aggressive. And I was like, it was just he saw a different thing than I saw. He was watching something else play out. Like I said, he was he was really quite unwell at the time. You know, he, so he, he just... His appreciation for literature and for the written word. Like I said, he, he was a Renaissance man in a lot of ways. Did you grow up reading that stuff? Like just hanging in the house? I grew up in, you know, we, we spent as much time as possible. My, my father is of a generation. They don't, they don't, they don't only revere his father. My father stood up every time his father came into the room and he wouldn't call him you. He would say, the Tata. So, uh -huh. He would talk to him in third person. Does the Tata want yeah. a drink of water? The reverence for him, not in, in a very scary way. You know, we're very approachable, but we spent a lot of time with him, and we loved what he came to. He came to Montreal for Pesach. We went to the Yom Tevim, Rashayim Kippur. We spent a lot of time. Then when I landed in Lakewood as a bacher, I went to every Shabbos to the shul. So I grew up around him. I can't tell you I read the same things he was reading. I, I couldn't keep up with him, but he, he was familiar with everything in, in a very deep way, not just the superficial knowledge. And he loved the idea of writing, and he, lo he loved reading. You know, that, that was, that was the, the something that... He, he liked books. He liked Sfarim. He'd go on a plane. He had this... So we grew up with him. my father as well. My father's a magnificent writer and, and again, not a professional writer, but he, he is a great speaker, very eloquent. But he's able to articulate ideas and words. Uh, my father's ability to do that is, is, I still haven't found anybody who's able to do it like him. He's able to take an idea. So we, we had a, a very, our Shabbos table growing up. My grandfather's on the west side and my father's in Montreal was wide open. That means you didn't know how many guests there were going to be. You didn't know what type of guests there were going to be. And you didn't know until the meal themselves who they were going to be. The people who were in Montreal growing up that if you had a guest, if you met somebody, you just brought them to the show where we dive, and then you'll find my father, and they'll, they'll be taken care of. So he'd speak at the Shabbos table like a, like a real speech. You know, a lot of times based, my father was very, very uh, close to Lubavitch. He looked at the Sikh and Lubavitch, but he would take out an idea. He wouldn't obviously read the Sikh and say, yeah. and whoever the audience was, we had a lot of guests in Merchus, Raul, Yushalayim, Ayyid, and Hasid, and a lot of times there are people who knew nothing about Judaism, men, women, different ages, different stages, and he was somehow in seven minutes able to give over something. So I just, I would marvel at, at this ability he had that, to take a sophisticated idea that most people, learned people, could struggle with and, and convey it. 
So it, I can't tell you it's unnatural for me to try to do the same thing. I camp. I'm, I'm a big proponent of the camp because I, a lot of a lot of talents that people have don't come out. Yes. In the issue. It's, 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 it's my a first writing job was was my camp newspaper. Come on. The News and Schmooze. Camp System Day Camp. That's where I got started. Camp, like, when else am I going to be writing art? I was in, like, eighth grade. And feel good about it. That means... Right and camp yeah. need people to do that. that they, right? Correct. And it, it's it's a hot button topic today. It's, I don't think this podcast focuses so much on current uh, Haredi coffee room hack. <laughs> the, the summer is shrinking. You know, a lot yes. of the moved to an eleven month sure school year, and that's uh, way above my pay grade. Something's going to be lost in the process. You lose something because camp because, is and yeshiva bachim themselves who gain so much from being counselors are losing that opportunity. You know, which leads them to road trips, and it's a whole a road trip. Conversation we'll get to your for another day. <laughs> the, the camp, I was in camp and they needed someone to write songs, Color War, and I was pretty shy and hesitant to do it. I had good friends who pushed me and I wrote a song that in my camp, at least in Camp Monk, became part of the uh -huh. part of the canon. So I thought, I felt like I could do it. So, but would you say your entry into writing was through like, like songwriting in camp? into realizing that I could use I could do something. Cry. Uh, my entry is, there's such a power in this that I can impact people in a way that can move them to emotion or to joy or to pride in being Jewish or whatever it is. That's really something. That's a weapon. Uh, Do you remember and, the name of the song, that first song? Of course I remember the name of the song. I remember every word in the song. Well, what, what was the song? The, it was, the theme was Shem Shabbos against the Eli Ragal Kent Monk from the first Rabbi Monk that saw okay. the Monk. They call it Hashkafa War, not Kala War. And they make sure not to call, call the teams red and blue or, you know, they call teams based and they want the kids to work out the Hashkafa. So they'll always yeah. take two opposing Hashkafa terms, Basil and Beishamai. Uh, Hashkafa meaning like the Jewish values. Do, and and something. each team has to work out, yeah. defend their, their thing through their cheers and through their songs and through their art yeah. and through their message. And, and it, it's a it's a profoundly educational experience. You don't even realize it. That you're, so it was the Kingdom against Na'arim, Basil against Beishamai. So what was your song? Shemir Shabbos? Yeah. The words? Yeah. I'm not going to sing it. You're you, you, you not paying me enough to sing on this. <laughs> but you remember the in song. In a world yeah. devoid of emotion. Yeah. We greet this day with love and devotion. Infused with the Shabbos, take a glow. Pause. If you knew the tune would be better. How I ache for the many who don't know. So that was a line that till today. Wow. Um, that is beautiful. It, it, it's exactly what I would want I mean, to say about Shabbos. for the many who don't know about Shabbos. Yeah, and then the high part was whatever it was. It worked. Gifted soloist. You know, I didn't. I didn't do the music. Uh, other people more talented than me did. Then they were able to convey that musically. And I remember the judges telling me after that 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 line, uh, "How I ache for the many who don't know," because I, I think that every Jew, on some level, has this this deep emotional connection to Shabbos. Even yes. However complex the relationship is with the day on a practical level. Yeah. It's part of. It, sure. It's. Uh, we were just talking to somebody about this yesterday about Shabbos and and people who. Somebody, somebody called me up on there, a friend of mine. He says, you, you write, I wrote a book on Shabbos earlier this year with our school. It's sure. the first moments of Shabbos. It's called Exalted Moments. It's about Tadlach Kisneris, Birch Habanim, all the way through Kiddush. Yeah. So he says, you know, you're making my life very hard because I don't like Shabbos. And, and you talk in this like glorious sweeping way. I do these uh, video clips about Shabbos. You make it sound like every uh, you'd wait for Shabbos. I don't wait for Shabbos. I wait for Shabbos to end. I'm single. He's in his high 20s. He lives in a basement in wherever he lives sure. in Brooklyn. He says... Uh, during the week, I'm good. I have friends. I have my boys. I have uh, Shabbos for feel isolated. Shabbos, sure. he says, I'm, I'm eating by whichever guy. It's, it's just a, it's a very miserable time. And you write about Shabbos in such a romantic way. He says, you're very cute. You have a wife and children. Baruch Hashem. You, you like your Rav. Your community, etc. Et your, 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 your Rav's speeches actually interest you. You wait for them to hear what he's mm -hmm. going to say. So your, your experience, you're, you're very entitled and you're very clueless about what Shabbos really about feels Shabbos like when you're in your 20s. And you write these books with these beautiful pictures. And he says, not only you, he says, the whole Shabbos industry, what he called it, he goes, the music industry. If you look at any music video, so you have these music video, right? So you yeah. have words of a song, and the songs are always going to be something along the Shabbos, Halik, Freilich, whatever the words are going to yeah. be. And if they're more worldly and they're English, yeah. it's going to be more or less the same thing. Happy anticipation, waiting. Yeah. Uh, fears, tears, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yisrael, Lachayim, have, have a good day. And he says, well, what's going to be the music video? There's going to be some guy like it, it, with the sun setting and a violin sure, playing yeah, and yeah, a little yeah. cap and maybe a cow and a farmer and yeah. conveying these imagery of like the old Sages world, of Shtetl, Shtetl, Shabbos. Shtetl. And then uh, inevitable piano is going to drop down from somewhere. Suddenly we're in Shol and Talesim and dancing in Meisharim. And one Israeli soldier wanders into one, the studio. One, one, one. one. You want to do it, <laughs> yeah. but you want to be covered. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. There you go. And uh, all your token little appearances, and, and and now I want Shabbos. He says the music industry is just as guilty. You're you're marketing the best parts of Shabbos. That's your experience. The people who don't obviously you know who don't feel that. I was very, 
I was, I was very affected by his. So I went to Rabbi and I, I told him this story, this conversation. So he said, he's wrong and he's right. He's right because because that's his experience. And when a person tells you their experience, and you're a person who listens to people, sure. so you know that when someone tells you their experience, they're not lying, it's their experience. Yeah. You can't tell them they're lying. But he didn't take the time to find out what's inside of him and what Shabbos could mean. Now, I'm, I'm telling the seed of it. I, 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 I have since then, like informal data, people tell you that they're Rahman al-San in a hospital for Shabbos. They, they were stuck somewhere, they were stranded in the airport, they were in a hotel room en route, and they're like I canceled, then they spent Shabbos. They had to make Shabbos in a hospital or wherever it is. They will often end up by saying, was the best Shabbos of my life. Why? That means they came into Shabbos, the sun was setting, Rahman al you know that, that hospital mindset, you don't even know if it's day or night, yeah, or Tuesday sure. or Thursday. You should never have to be there, no, no should, nor should any of your listeners. And suddenly it's Shabbos, and there's clacking uh, carts and uh-huh. things and beeping, and suddenly you go to the chapel, and uh, there's going to be other Jews here in hospital gowns. And everybody realizes we have to make Shabbos. There's no other way. So that Lechadaydi becomes, you're making Shabbos. La says it's a Shabbos. You're creating Shabbos. You're bringing it down. It's not naturally, you know, we press a button and Shabbos comes our way. Boom, 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 I boom. I call it Shabbos for grown-ups. Shabbos for grown-ups. When, you, when you're a child, Shabbos is always made for you. And even when you're an adult sometimes, you know, you're the kind of person, oh, you're just waiting, sitting there, waiting for Shabbos to kind of descend. And there's a Shabbos for grown-ups which is all the stress. Did you did you remember to get the thing from the dry cleaning? Who picked up the fruit? Who put up the hot plate? You set the refrigerator, all that stuff. And it's stressful and it's not convenient and it's difficult. But that's kind of but where you... Make f- Shabbos. Yeah. That makes Shabbos. That's what, that's what, that's what it is. I, 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 this image stays with me. I once tried uh, conveying it in writing. I don't think I did justice to it. It just reminded me of it. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know your, your listener base and what triggers people. I was in Yerushalayim for Shabbos. It was uh, in Mir Shiva, and I was walking in the alleys of Meir Sharam. It was very, very close to Shabbos already. It was Eid walking. He was in a brown bekshin, a gold bekshin. He was smoking a cigarette. And he was looking at his gold watch, and he was looking at the sky. He was <laughs> inhaling. And he took that last puff, and he looked at his gold pocket watch, and he flicked the cigarette into the garbage, and he put it in, and it was just a moment. To it's a scene there. It was a scene of, of, of something That's, happening. Yes. Mm-hmm. Shabbos. Making Shabbos. Making Shabbos. So people tell you, like I said, the hospitals, I was stuck in that hotel, and, and you know, a friend of mine was telling to me this week, he was stuck in a hotel in Amsterdam, but don't show, whatever the situation was, what a Shabbos, or somebody ended up by a Chabad house somewhere, what a Shabbos that was, because you were actually forced, like you're saying, to make Shabbos for grown-ups. So whenever he told me about the, this friend of mine, he said, you should start learning with him on Friday, say, first, the Dura Shabbos, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable sefer. It's the Shal Shabbos. And the Dura Shal Shabbos, one, written one of the one, one of the early tzaddikim, Berimachayim, one of the early uh, early tzaddikim, and he takes you through what what happens in the world, starting from mm-hmm. Shabbos all the way till Matzah Shabbos, Taisa Shabbos, and we learn it every Friday. I can't tell you that it, it changed his life or my life in a significant way, but it's definitely something we both look forward to. And and when you realize that there's an obligation on you to prepare for Shabbos, then Shabbos becomes more to you. That that's just about the song about the yeah Shabbos. no that's I don't it, know how it, we got it's because because I was asking you how you fell in love with writing and I kind of wanna I, I love that it got started in camp I'm curious I the first book that I ever read from you and maybe I missed previous ones but like I feel like you broke out was the book on Rip Shlomo Freifeld it's called Rip Shlomo uh, I grew up a few blocks away from the new Shari Yashiv. I used to learn in the old Shari Yashiv. he was the rush of Shari Yashiv. he was a student. Of Rav Hutner, who you know animates, who, was, who himself was a student of the Alter Slabodka. I'm curious, how do you choose the topics, the personalities that you write about? Meaning, you did the Rav Five, and it was like a perfect gel of a personality and the writer, like in the exact right hands. It was not an art school biography. I feel like art school still to this day. I hope they look at it as the one that got away. Uh, but but I'm curious, how, how do you choose? There's so many people to write about. You've written about the Hassam Sofer. You've written about Rabbi Shailov, Karastir, you've written about uh, Moshe Reichman. How do you pick the personalities that you write about? Has, has that process changed? So Rabbi Shailov was instructive to me. I was, like I said, I was a Rebbe, and I, I to supplement my income, because as you may know, Rebbe, am I not overpaid? You're not overpaid, correct. Right. So, uh, so I, I was writing a little bit for Mishpacha. I felt like my, my writing for Mishpacha was a complete outgrowth of my relationship to my grandfather. I would mm-hmm. sit with him. My wife, Shishmi Gozantan Shak, would encourage me. I was in Kaidal, I was a Rebbe, we came to Mansi for the summers, and I would just want to spend time with my grandfather on the West Side, and she all, we had little kids, and she always told me, take the car, just go, go to your grandfather, as much time as you want to, to her enduring credit. She really gave me that time, and I would just sit with him, and I would write with a pen and paper, just write, write, mm-hmm. write, whatever he wanted to talk about. 
So one of the people he liked to talk about was the Belushi of a rabbi. That was one of the more impactful sure. rabbis on him. They were first cousins. The Rabbitson and him were first cousins. My grandfather was extremely close to, to him, and my grandfather was fascinated by what he had done. The current Belushi of is his son? The, 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 so the Belushi of Rebbe, in very short, Rabbi Israel Shapiro was a dynasty. He was the yeah. he, Prachna, he came from uh, Rebetich, came from a big dynasty of rabbis, Galatiana rabbis, Tzvi Tzadik. His grandfather was one of the biggest rabbis. He lost everything in the war. Rachman al wife, children. In the camps, he, there was a woman. Her name was Branya Kashitsky, my grandfather's first cousin. My grandfather's name was actually Kashitsky. He changed it. His father, his parents had changed it right before the war for various reasons. And she had two boys. And her boys were very, you know, by, by Hadlakas Neres Hanukkah, they were there. But when the rabbi wanted matzah, she had a famous vikuach. This woman had a vikuach with the rabbi, the fight with the rabbi, an argument with the rabbi. You wouldn't give matzah to the children. So she said, who's the future? Who's matzah? Who's the lel haseder for, if not for the children? Why are we here? That no one should remember? They're the ones who need the matzah. And yeah. he was very taken by her spirit. And subsequently, after the war, they found out that his family was gone, and she had lost her husband as well. And they got married. Even though she wasn't, so to speak, yeah. from the Rebbe dynasty, he married her, and he took her on her two sons. He never had children again with her. And he raised her two sons. The, the son and successor, his name was Tzvi Yehuda, the her older son, the blood of the Rebbe, he's not around it was, anymore. But it's your cousin. It was, uh, she was my grandfather's first cousin, so her son and successor once told me, he's not around, he passed away several years, I interviewed him. I'm just, the reason why I add, we have a family connection. My father took care of the blood of the Rebbe, he had a bracha at my sister's wedding, and the Kiddush cup that we use, which is remarkable that you said this, on Pesach is from the blood of the Rebbe, inscribed to my father. I didn't know that you had a connection That's to something. that. something, yeah, sure. The Rebbe told me the the he's not around like I said anymore. He looked exactly like his father, exactly. He, yeah, his countenance, the his, the successor, but they weren't related. They had no blood relation. So I said to him, I commented. I said if I could comment on the fact that the rabbi's physical resemblance to his father is startling, considering the fact that he's not even your father. Yeah. So he told me there's a halacha in halachas trefus, the halachas of an animal that gets damaged. If we're like, right, Jews don't eat animals that aren't destined to live. The animal that has death in it already yeah it's not it's a trefa you can't you can't check that animal you can't slaughter it and there's halacha and halachas trefas of broken bones and the words are shever al shever yachtev yadvay that means if you have two broken bones and they get close to each other they can heal from they one confuse. another so they confuse thank you so even even if you see a broken bone it doesn't mean that the animal's going to be a trefa wait a little bit because another broken bone they might fuse together, together. Confused. he says that was me and my father wow he says he was a broken shever, he was a shever and he said i was a shever kaylee i had no father and he he had no children two and broken together, spirits fusing together one, so, he said, why shouldn't i look like him that's very sweet so he passed away his sons are our are, are rabbis now okay different different, different uh, shuls and it's a beautiful chassidus and they're, 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 there's something very rich and very very deep in that chassidus still today but come back to the rib shlomo let's come back to, to so i wrote an article on the blush of a rabbi yeah and i wanted to mishpacha was the only show in town i you know i knew hebrew mishpacha i always liked israeli politics when i lived in israel i was a uh, avid reader of anything to do with Israeli, Israeli, uh -huh. I still love Israeli politics, Israeli politicians, and it fascinates me, like sports, fascinate other people. So I, I knew about the Hebrew Mishpach, I, I just, I felt like they maybe would do something, and I sent it in, and after it took a while to, for them to get back to me, and then they printed it, it was my first article printed. I said, I could do this, and it's actually the yard site, tomorrow, two days, is the yard site of Al Wasserman. Okay. So the Rav in Montreal then was Yerba from David Nizhnik. He was the Rav Rashi, chief rabbi in Montreal. And I interviewed him about Rav I wrote it up. I sent it to Mishpacha. It was another, uh, another $200. Maybe, yeah. You know, <laughs> whatever it was, $250 maybe. And, and I sent it in and they printed it. So I, I realized I like doing these things. So 90% of it was my grandfather, but I, I kind of developed a, a sideline to being a yeah. rabbi of interviewing people. I, just, I'm sorry, step back about books and writing. I didn't like the way a lot of the Gadalian biographies were written or the way they Why? were being passed down. Because it was like a Wikipedia entry. Not, I'm not saying any, any particular book or yeah. writer. It was just dates and places. So I think that there was a time when emotionless writing worked. People wanted to know the basic details. Born, dead. Yeah. Then they all sound the same. I wanted to hear from the people who were closest to them. Laughed after the people who knew the Torah of the Rebbe. Laughed after the person or the person who sat in front of him and transcribed every word. Just people who were there. What was it like? I wanted to get over the vibe, as yeah. you say today, the atmosphere of the court, of the yeshiva. And so I would just start interviewing all the people. I, I liked listening to all the people, I, you know, and I, I, liked, I liked writing it over. And I was doing that for Mishpacha. So I put out a book. It was called Warm by the Fire. It was my first book. It was a collection of 
vignette, vignette stories. Just, each one was one person on their rabbi. Yeah. Right? So each thing. So today's the outside of the Kleisenberg rabbi. So I interviewed somebody who, who I knew yeah. very close to the Kleisenberg rabbi. And I went through different rabbis in Gedalim. I tried as much as possible not to make it, to try to bring it down that people didn't know that much about. Sure. You know, not only, and, and to run to run the, you know, over a period of 100 years. It wasn't yeah. confined to any. A lot of it was my grandfather, but not only. And I put it through with Art School. It was not a big commercial success. It was maybe even a failure, the first book. It wasn't, wasn't a big success. What, do you, what, 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 what numbers would you consider a failure when you write a book? I didn't know anything about books oh, then. You didn't even know numbers. And the book market then was much bigger. Now the book market is much smaller. Smaller yeah, now, Now said. I would say 3,000 is a nice book amount of books because what happened is in the film world, that's all there's the internet. You can read so much. Yeah. Second of all, there's magazines. So you, you could spend $20 on a shop yeah. and get all the magazines and newspapers and then put them in the garbage after. You, you know, Correct. Uh, maybe you and me suffer from the, the thing with the wife, with shelf space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. you planning to put that exactly? Yeah. Are you building an extension? Where, <laughs> right? With magazines and newspapers, you don't have it. You get rid of it. So yeah. it's very hard for someone to sell a book, right? Yeah. These days. So the numbers have gone down, and there's a lot more books. You know, yeah. We're kids, it's we're crazy. Books twice a year. There's, every two weeks or three weeks, there's this new look at, look at them ads. Yeah. So it's much harder to sell a book today than it was then. But it, was, it wasn't a big success. It, was, it just wasn't great. There are a couple of people who, Rabbi Zlotowicz, Oliver Shalom, Rabbi Meir Zlotowicz, told me, you're a writer. Like, stick with it. Don't worry about okay. it. I had an uncle. I don't, I don't talk about him a lot. My mother's brother. He's not around anymore. His name was Rabbi Yitzchak Kapner. It's hard for me to talk because I feel like I would talk about it and people wouldn't believe that such a person existed. Okay. So I don't talk. People think I'm exaggerating. I lived in Eretz Yisrael. Grew up a child of Holocaust survivors like my mother. Went to Eretz Yisrael, Toronto. Went to Eretz Yisrael at about 17 and never came back. He knew Kalatari Kula Ba'iyan. Everything Kabbalah. He, there was nothing he didn't know. He sat in the house in Hanof, didn't really want jobs. A very happy, easy, easy person. He knew Kalatari Kula. There was no, nothing that you could know. He didn't just know Kalatari Kula. He lived Kalatari Kula in the sense that he, his whole life was Taira. He wouldn't, he wouldn't say Birch Taira during the week because he was, his wife told me after he passed away that he would get up in the middle of the night and take a safer off a shelf and look at something, go back to bed for a little bit. He, he was said, literally in it the whole Shabbos, week. Shabbos, he said, Birch Zatayra. Because Shabbos, you get a new Tayra. That's how it says. So on Shabbos, he said, Birch Zatayra again. This is he, your uncle. My uncle, my mother's brother. Okay. He, he wouldn't kiss the Tayra. He didn't feel. He would, he would walk up and look at it reverently and step back. But he was also a very easy, pleasant, delightful person. He was just, he was great. Yeah. We, we in Eretz we all got very close to him. All my sisters, when they went to seminary, me and Yeshiva in Eretz got close to him. We knew things that others didn't know, but I could go to him and say, uh, I have a flight to catch, and he'd say, you'll make it, or don't bother, or, or um, my wife is expecting, you're going to have a boy, you're going to have a girl, uh, do surgery, don't do surgery. He was a little bit of a rabbi in our family, and okay. the thing we talked about, his kids knew this as well. He lived in a, in a, in a world above nature completely. Sure. He, he lived, and I don't talk about it, I don't write about it, it's too baked into who I am, that relationship, and again, I, I, I have too much respect for him to talk, and people say, it's not possible, but anybody who knows about this man knows that everything I'm saying is true. He, he people, Tzadikim would look at him and they would say, whoa, he, he was at his Shabbos table. was just, he, he lived in another sphere. His, his devotion to understanding an idea and learning by his, by his Leviah, somebody said, a and they said, what's up, Itcha, Yitzchak? What's he thinking now? As his Neshama goes up, He's thinking, oh, that's what Zika means. Zika is a term in the Avamas, <laughs> yeah. right? That means his whole life was consumed. What does Zika mean? And he just got another Hasaga. That's what he's thinking. As the Shama goes up and he gets close to the Yeshiva Shamala. That's yeah. how he, how does the Shtar work? I could come into that house. He says, how does the Shtar work? What is it? He, these kind of things that other people say, leave me alone. I don't yeah. know. I don't, he lived in those conversations. He needed to understand everything. He knew physics because it helped him understand Kabbalah. So he sat with a, a physicist. He was a very special, his heart for, for broken people. His heart, again, he was one in a million. So he would come to Montreal to visit my mother. Okay. So he was in our house once he read the book, Warm by the Fire. I said, okay, so what do you think of my book? So he said, you wrote about Rabbi Hirschsprung. Rabbi Hirschsprung was a guy. He was a rabbi in Montreal. And my uncle, 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 uncle was a Talmud of his because he had moved back from Eretz Yisrael for two years when my grandfather wasn't well, my mother's father, to take care of him. And he learned about Rabbi Hirschsprung. And Rabbi Hirschsprung, he said, you didn't get him. You're, you're feeling for Rabbi Hirschsprung, clearly. He, I saw what you wrote about him. You don't begin to... to Understand. You're not conveying why you people have a yeah. special affinity to Rav Hirschbrunn because he's the one person who Rav Schechter, when he publishes Sfarim, would always request uh, approbation, a haskama from Rav Hirschbrunn specifically. And like, Shofu, you, have, you saw his haskama? You're right. Well, it says in Gittin that, the, that there was a wealthy people in Yerushalayim 
and they didn't know one person had enough of a storehouse that keep them for 20 years yeah and one person had food and the sure. said, which was the best the let's the the, 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 the city, i think is the way the the logs yeah and says, which was the most valuable because without the logs you can't heat up food and the food is useless so he writes in his as a pun yeah just brilliant uh, brilliant brilliant but that's how i remember the first time i ever saw that name i'm like who's this rov in montreal that like Rav Schechter, so to speak, is reaching out there. So he said you should write on Rav, on Rav Hirschbrunk. No, he said you didn't get it. He, he said, didn't get he it. Said, he missed I read it. what you wrote in Warm by the Fire on okay. Rav You didn't begin to get it. You're not. He said, there's a guy, Freifeld, him you connect to. Him you got. You should write a book on Freifeld. So I he said, told this to you. Yes. This is your own, this my like. Uncle. My uncle. I said, like, if I write a book on Rav Freifeld, will it be a bestseller? He said, yes. Like, I'll make it? He said, yeah, you'll like it. So already, again, if my siblings listen to this, they'll know that what I'm saying. And his children will know it's true. Not that many people. No, nope. he lived a life of complete hiddenness and seclusion and didn't want people to know him. The ones who knew him knew him in Yerushalayim. Oh. And he, he told me, yeah, if you do it, you'll do it. I said, great. That's a very rubbish beginning to a writing career. To this, it's fascinating. I, never, I don't think I ever said this over to anybody. Like, you're, you're, you're just making me remember. But tell me, now you decide to write a biography on Ruf Reifel. Can you take me through what is your process and has your process changed when you write a biography? Do you spend like six months jotting down stories? How do you organize them? Sequentially, I'm going to tell you, I have to finish the story. Yeah, Benji Brescia, who's the one who gets the credit for the book, called yeah. me the next day or the next week. He's like, Could you write a book? My Rebbe, I saw you write about a mishpacha. No, Un- unbeknownst to him, unbeknown- okay, nothing to do with my uncle. My uncle told me that, and it was in my head already. And he started to call me. Now, if you know Benji Brescia, he's relentless when he wants something, yeah, something like this. And he just would call me, call me, call me. I was still a Rebbe at that point, yeah. But then I said to myself, He told me what he would pay for a book, was basically what I was making as a Rebbe. It, uh, none of it, which were very impressive numbers, yeah. But it, I said, like, I'm not, I didn't, like I said, being a rabbi was very hard for me. I loved the boys. I, I didn't, I didn't love the, the, like I said, the administrative, tedious well, part. Confining or, today, yeah. Today, different. And I, I think my chinuch career would be much easier today. Yeah. The schools have gotten this. Yeah. But in those days, there was like, if you gave extra recess, then it became like, you had to explain to them, I'll fill out a, like, why? Yeah. You, I, I couldn't work that way. Yeah. You know, it was hard for me. So I said, okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving teaching and I'm going to write the book on every five for one year. So for one year, I have this uh, income. Because I'll have the book and every file to do it. And Mishpacha will continue to be my side income. That's how I live. So Baruch Hashem is pretty that's much. A, that's a big, um, big like jump without a safety net. Were you nervous like Alts Parnasa to leave a state? I, I, I needed very little. I mean, I was uh-huh. I had, coming from a kind of life. I needed rent, $900 a month. I have Baruch an easygoing wife. I had parents and in laws okay. who uh, would, I'm sure they would have had I'm my I'm a nervous guy. I, I mean, was, that's uh, my modern orthodoxy speaking. Like, I want, I, I need to know there's like a 401k set up and an IRA. Help that. Like, I get very nervous with it, with this stuff. As, as I stay tethered to a lot of things. To go off on your own is always scary. But you went off to take. Yeah, I had a rabbi. Yeah. And so, I, 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 you know, so the Freifeld book, I, I wouldn't write a book like that today. Freifeld book, there were no boundaries. There was no day. There was no night. I would have gone to the end of the world to hear one more. Story, story about Rabbi Freifeld. And just tell, take me through the just like the very bit, the process of writing a biography. You allot time to do interviews, right. and then you, you are you like are they on a spreadsheet? Is it like organized? I want to tell you things I told other writers that they found helpful. Actually. Yeah, please. So um, you start a biography. So uh, it, today, I, I would try. Hashem should continue to send me opportunities where I could choose the books that I feel not everybody has a luxury. I don't always have the luxury. Sometimes you. It's yeah. just a job like any other job. And you write on who you have to write on because you yeah. see the family. But if you have that blessing that you're able to choose, it has to be somebody that you connect with. And you, the first question you have to ask yourself is, if I could read about that person, would I want to read them? Or then we all have people yeah. that are more historical fi- figures that we connect with and some that we don't. So, or this is what I learned about my too. It has to be a, a milieu, a setting. I realized that there are no books on Gedalim from the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s in America. All the Gedalim we had were from Europe. So everybody knew about the childhood in Warsaw or Krakow Correct. Or, or, or Moscow or Budapest or, or uh, Ehel. No one knew about Brownsville and, and East New York Yeah, uh, about that time. Rather than this in Tolushkin's shul and growing up. Sure. And, 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 My grandfather's and, and, universe. A lot of people's grandfather's yeah. universe, right? And the charm yeah. and the strength and the courage of the people. There was no momentum to go to yeshiva then. Zero. Right. Right. I wrote this on the first and credit to the to the family in Rabbi Farafelt's because they, they really were very easy with what they let me write. Not mm-hmm. having family today, again, people are much more open. We can talk about that. The internet changed everything. For yeah. Because you can really, you have to write the truth. Because otherwise, cause they know. Some, yeah. it's, it's out there. 
So you're just going to look like an idiot and you're doing a disservice to your subject because people will say, what else did you cover up? Yeah. But in those days, I didn't, and his parents weren't holding my son to come to yeshiva. They wanted them to go to public school, see more. And Mrs. Freifel's neighbor said to her, if you send them to yeshiva, it's an extra hour a day. So you could help your husband in the shoe store for an extra hour. That was the whole yeah. decision-making process that gave us from Schleimer Freifeld. It was just a different time. So I, I very much enjoyed getting, I went to the, I went to the library in Montreal and I took out every book I could on Brown. So I read about the Jewish mafia, you know about Jewish mafia, the Jewish yeah, mafia, yeah, Malka, Buchalter, and, and not only Bugsy Siegel, but uh, Mary Lansky. Uh, Brown's old based mafia. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. And Abe, triple, triple something, men's clothing, the, yeah. the big men, the big Jewish leaders yeah. of the time and the Knishas for 10 cents. Just, I fell in love with all of that. So that's the first step. If you're going to write a biography and you're going to be successful, you have to feel it. You have okay. to want to tell the story and you want it. You have to want to hear. You have to be ready. Imagine that you're at the end of a Tinus and they just have a marriage and it's Shavas over Thomas and it's 9.48 at night and you're starving. And the guy says, do you want to hear a story about Ray Freifeld? If the answer's not yes, don't write a biography. <laughs> you have to be so into it that yeah. you have to be ready to drop everything yeah. at any moment to say another story, another yeah. detail. Another guy who's going to tell me a story I know, but with a little bit of a different nuance, then you have to do that. Now, the joy of being a biography writer is that you have a rabbi. I'm sure you have more of your parents. If you were asked to tell about them, tell me about your rabbi. You're going to tell them your best memories. That doesn't mean that every encounter you had with your rabbi was pleasant. It doesn't mean uh -huh. that they didn't disappoint you. It doesn't mean that you didn't get frustrated by people you love. Uh -huh. A biography writer is really getting everybody's best moments, right? No one's telling you uh -huh. their darkest moments and their worst moments. So what you're doing is you're presenting the person as everybody's best experiences, uh -huh. which is which is great and it's fair, but you also have to, again, you don't want to be silly. If you're going to portray the person, there's a risk when you do that, that everyone's just, everyone's great. Uh, did you, Rav David Bashev, can for, forgive me for being personal. Do you have a fight with your wife? I have. Do you love your wife? Very much so. Right. Now, if you, you were doing a, if you were talking to somebody about it, you wouldn't talk about the fight, but there's a Correct. reality here. Correct. Too. So when you read that book, there's life, there's real life. So that, that has to come through. So the risk of, of biography writers runs. It, it's not an inaccurate portrait because everyone's memories are true, but people who knew him all say, it doesn't ring true. That wasn't, uh -huh. it can't be. So that's the second step of biography. Besides that somebody you have to want to know about, you have to know about their imperfections and are you comfortable with that? Because yeah. some people whose imperfections make it, not I, comfortable with. I, I don't have a sympathetic eye towards somebody yeah. who, if I heard about a rabbi who, who was physically abusive, there's something that I wouldn't be able to write his book. Yeah. That's not an imperfection I could deal with. If I heard a rabbi who, Rabbi Shlomo Freifeld, was a miserable fundraiser. Yeah. He was. Yeah. Um, Shlomo Freifeld, that kind of thing uh, doesn't really bother me that yeah. much. Well, that doesn't take away from his, you know, his, his greatness. His executive abilities don't take away from the yeah. fact that he's great behind I can do. So you, you have to make sure that you connect with the whole picture uh -huh. of, the, of, the, of, the, of the subject. And then and there's, it's very interesting in biography writing. There's always the people you must speak to. Those yeah. people are generally helpful, but they're never where the gold is. That means, you know, children of G'dayalim are very complicated. It's very complicated. Most children of great G'dayalim, Rosh Hashivas, Rabbis, have a little bit of a, it's a confusing relationship because, because their, their parents belong to the Kleist, well, not to them. They yeah. didn't have a normal parent relationship. They also didn't have... Um, Again, that ability of distance. The Talmud comes in. He, sees, he hasn't seen the rabbi in six months. Should I take the job? Should I not take the job? Yeah. Should I do the shidduch? Should I not? The rabbi says something amazing. Tells him something about himself and he leaves. A child's living with the parent. Every day. day. It, it's very, it's, it's not as glorious. It's not as romantic. Correct. So you need to sit with them. First of all, because you need the facts. It'll, you know, you need the Wikipedia entry to make it your life. So you need to sit with the people close. But then you really have to turn over every stone to get to the distant Talmud. The guy who was in Shariash of, let's just say, because that was my first one for a month. But he had that one moment with the rabbi. And it helped a lot that a lot of the things I saw in my own rabbi and the people I look up to, Rabbi Freifeld was just the way ahead of his time. Uh -huh. I mean, so I wrote the book in 2007. He had died in 1992, I think, 92, 93, yeah. something like that. And the world was not at all in the place where it was when I wrote the book in terms of how to see other people, acceptance, non-judgmentalism, being tolerant, seeing Nishmas Yisrael as something glorious, seeing the greatness in other people, conveying the greatness in other people to themselves. The world was ready for it when I wrote it. The Renaissance runs. I think world. the world literally was ready for it. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I quote you constantly, but you know, I've I've shared with you many times the the idea. The it's a vart uh, that's in the book that literally stays with me. It can move me to tears because I, I I find it to be one of the most beautiful things in the world. Is you have in the book and the way you tell you, you have a really beautiful way of telling over vart luch, which I haven't quite mastered. Because when I write, it comes off a little bit more um, 
uh, secularized because I deliberately use almost always like English terminology. But could so, uh, not fully. I really try my best to instill that like that hearts, you know, that that emotion. But it does always come out when the language is a little bit more formal. You use big words. People get turned. It's hard to get you know emotionally nostalgic when you're talking about a tractate. You know what I mean? Like there's certain words that like they're turnoffs for I know for so, some of my readers because I'm using that, but. You have a really beautiful way of writing, and there's this beautiful Torah that you have there. I think it captures such as this biography, but so much of what you try to do uh, is the is the idea from the Alexander Rebbe, where Rev. Freifel says that you have to work, walk 3,000 miles for this Torah. It's worth it, and he talks about a pasuk in, uh, in, in Shmuel Bays, where he says that when David HaMelech was running away from Shaul, and he was being pursued and killed, he had this little band of brothers. He has the Ish Tsar Matzuk and the Ish No Say Avon, and all these like people who are... Ish Hashalai Naisha, anybody who has a credit or chase account. Yeah. Every, all the, the bank all, is after him. Yeah, and there's this beautiful line that you that you have, according to Freifeld, but I think it speaks to your larger work, where, again, I'll, I'll say, and you could just, you could finish it, where where he says, the beauty of what David HaMelech did is that the, per, the person running from a creditor, the person who's broken, the person who's tired, David HaMelech calls them each an Ish a person, to give them that dignity, that inner spirit. And you end off the vart that that's why David was called the Yifei Enayim, that he had beautiful eyes. You, say, you think he had blue eyes? It was he knew how to see people. He knew how to see people. So I'm curious, I think of that vart when I think of your work. You know, Rav Tversky one time said, I, I wrote one book 22 times, you know, Rav Abraham J. Tversky, the, the great uh, psychiatrist. And I feel like, you know, you, Something could be said similar to you. Do you think there's truth to that, that you, you have like a core idea that you kind of like unfold many, many times? I, to me, a little bit comes down to this like Yefe Enayim idea of being able to look at, I don't want to call it old-fashioned Yiddishkeit, but that instinctive Yiddishkeit that people have, giving it a platform, giving it a megaphone. I think that by definition, a lot of the, now to be fair, I don't get the biographies of the, Call them the A list, or in the sense of Rabbi Asher, of Nassim Svi, of Chaim Kanievsky. Do you want them? It's irrelevant. If I yeah. want them. And I don't get them because I don't think that's my talent. I think yeah. the Russian gave me an ability to take people who rubbed David Trank, let's say, who, yeah. who died. He, maybe he had a 30 Tommy the Mizishiva, if yeah. that much. Rabbi Asher Freifel had about 30 when he died also. Yeah. None, none, not Rabbi Asher Freifel, not David Trank. Let's take books that book on each other yeah. with, a, with 15 years between them, were people who were considered a success. By the world's terms. But if you talk to the Talmudim, you say, wow, I want to write about it. So Hashem allowed me, I, I, again, some cipher doesn't really fit, but some cipher speaks to another need I had, yeah. which was to to create an emotional, I, I, some cipher, let's just say, people, you're going to hear his name every day. If you're yeah. in Lakewood, if you're in Brisk, if you're in Satmar, and if you're in YU, you're going to hear some cipher's name in some, either in Halacha or in Chedusha Agada, in Chedusha Mal Shas, or Agada, sure. or, or, or a, a, a Hashkafa position. Yeah. Sam Seifer is the defining father of contemporary yeah. Haredi jewelry, for sure. So it was, nobody really has an emotional understanding of what Sam Seifer was or what he stood for. It's, so the, the, I, I need a challenge in order to, to be able to do my job. I need, I need something and say, I need to be able to sort of, and now look, right? I, I don't want to tell you things you know. So I, I shied away, or Hashem has allowed me to not end up I, I find it much harder to write. So David Feinstein, let's say, to me was my most thrilling book because he was a completely hidden person. You know, people tell me all the time, I read the book, I wish I would have met him. He was right here. I said, you don't have to feel bad because if you would have met him, you would have seen nothing. There would have been nothing in your meeting that would have left you any more impressed. Yeah. So you, you saved yourself a trip to the east side and probably a parking ticket. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. Like, such kadusha, such such greatness in Tyra, such greatness in, in, in humanity. But Misha Feinstein's son, say Misha Feinstein's successor, a, 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 a Palmyphus, which is the least of, of the, the, the smallest yeah, wonder is how many, yeah. how many miracles and brachas. That's the smallest part of a David's story. Yeah. The miracle of what he did to, to himself and how he saw people, the way he built up people, his good sky, his goodness, his the, the, the humility, the marriage, the relationship to the rabbits, and those kind of things. So that's enjoyable for me. You didn't know that, right? Now look, like that, because that's what, that's what motivates me. I want to, I always want to follow, go down another rabbit hole and another rabbit hole so that you can't write good biographies if you're not intrigued. That means if you know everything about the topic, you press a button and, okay, here's my statement. That's not a book. 
it, it comes across as hollow. You know, you, you confront those people. You're much more in that arena than I than I am. Uh, what do Orthodox Jews think about? And what do Orthodox Jews and, and that whole world is fascinated by, by Orthodox Jews, like the like little um, little uh, uh, in the aquarium behind the glass, little yeah. s- fishies uh, swimming around. Let's analyze them. They sound so flat and hollow. And even if the facts that they're saying may or may not be true, it doesn't resonate with any Orthodox Jews. That's not what it is, because you, you, you're not intrigued. And if you're not intrigued, then what you're trying to say is going to come. So a writer has to be, the chase has to has to thrill you in order to give it over well. So much of what you do is like, you know, I, I once called you the Rebleve Yitzchuk Mi of vaping. You know, I feel like you've written columns and the things that trigger people in regular communities, uh, you know, you see a yeshiva guy smoking a cigarette, you know, or you know, all the things that, that trigger, you know, well-established, buttoned-down, this is what's wrong, and you've written many, many columns, and I think it, it, this kind of love underlies a lot of your a lot of your books, like giving that dignity, that importance of like the Yiddishkeit that are that hides in the nooks and crannies of Jewish life. I'm curious for you, how do you avoid? How do you avoid? You know, end up you know validating, and this is something that I've struggled with in conversations that you've had validating something that like we shouldn't be glorifying you know somebody who's you know not not really uh holding up to the ideals of yiddishkeit and i almost have a second question which is how do you stay so centrally located and not cynical when you're i feel like your whatsapp and your your your, you get every story everybody's sending you stuff but you you seem to be able to retain a very well anchored view of Yiddishkeit without getting pulled into, I think, areas that are questionable or inappropriate. And at the same time, you also you, you don't get cynical about yesh, you know the yeshiva world. Can I ask you a personal question? Please. Okay. Have you ever interviewed people, maybe on this podcast or maybe in other capacities, that said things or took positions that you knew were counter to Torah living and what Hashem wants in His Torah? The Torah, that's yours. That yeah. That you have to give up your life for. Yes. Right? Have you they, they ever? Have you ever been for in that sure. situation? I think. I, what I, was your reaction? I think I've handled it poorly sometimes. I think I've handled it well sometimes. I mean, we, you you've spoken to me about this before. And you and died. Well, we've discussed this. Yeah. When I've called it, I said, yeah. no, but how do you let somebody say something like that, which and, is essentially a knife in the back of of the Rebbe Shalom himself? That means the Rebbe Shalom gave us a time. He made it very clear yeah. what he thinks is okay. And in the, in this new uh, sphere that people have of saying something mm-hmm. that might cancel, brand, uh, offend, etc., hurt, etc., um, you feel like you're opting for silence. And if I can quote your answers to me, a lot of times we discuss you have tremendous avos yisrael, and maybe your avos yisrael even impairs your judgment sometimes, right? For sure, for sure, yes, yes, yes. Now, I, do I've you always... take a sympathetic view of yourself for having so much avos yisrael that even when someone expresses something that um will term as kfira or or just the co- complete uh like i said a complete negation of tyrim and Ashaman yeah or the validity and, and relevance of what words in the tyrim mean until 2023 yeah, yeah, yeah. you didn't react um with, with fire and brimstone no go into jihad mode no or no what your friend awkward Bacha calls a kanai mode deactivated mode <laughs> Can I mode deactivated mode <laughs> yeah you don't go like that because no. you love you then you see that trust as well i think that you're not giving yourself enough credit it's not just i love jews it's also you see that people are struggling so badly and you know that they don't mean a lot of times the things they're saying but they're hurting so yeah it's counterproductive so you've done yourself a cops cause. so why don't you understand that i love the elmi yeshivas I love Yeshiva Bachram. I had such a nice opportunity last week. I have a son, he's 17 years old. He's graduating high school. I've taken Yeshiva next year. In Montreal, they graduated at 11th grade, not at 12th grade. So I, I went on a journey through the Ilum Yeshivas trying yeah. to figure out the right fit for him. So we went on a car for a week and I went to five Yeshivas in three days. I came up to my wife. I, I said, it just, it was Mesh of Nash restored my soul. Because you walk into these yeshivas, one dumpy house and another that's undergoing construction, total <laughs> building permits already yeah, yeah, yeah. after another. You see the vibrant, beautiful, successful. These are kids, uh, 17, 18, 19, 20 year old boys vaping. <laughs> or not. Or not. But, but on yeah. that shirt with coffee stays on their shirt. Yeah. Proud, happy, excited. Come to Yeshiva. We love our Yeshiva. Boys who, like I said, you don't have to go anywhere. Go into Target and look at any 18 year old, it's like summer now, look at any secular teenager. 
they, that age, boy or girl, not, not only, not only, I forget the most basic uh, instincts that, of teenagers that our, our yeshiva bracham are, are by and large holding out to, the, the, how sad they look, how unhappy they look, how undefined they are without the, having to deal with the society that doesn't even let them decide their own gender, meaning that there's so much indecision and so much confusion and so much worry, it's hard enough even without all the, all yeah. the, all the, the woke agenda. And, and look, go into any yeshiva, any yeshiva, Beis Gimel Dalet Yeshiva. I'm not talking about going in only into Aleph Yeshivas. And, and look at the Bacham. Look at the Rosh Yeshiva who could be teaching in Aleph Yeshivas, who choose to give their lives to Beis Gimel Dalet. They, they would much rather help a Bacha, spend three hours helping a Bacha understand the Rashi. Is every Bacha and every Yeshiva using their time so perfectly? Of course not. Is anybody in any... What, what, do, what do we need to do all day, Bacham? <laughs> we do nothing. We do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 nothing. We fuss around for yeah. three hours and yeah. we, we get busy with the stupidities. So they're, they're people, right? They're young yeah. people. But look at the products that's coming out consistently. So I, I just, I don't have patience for people taking pot shots. Yeshiva boys are whipping boys. Yeshiva are whipping yeah. boys for everything. Punching so bag for the everything. guys who are taking the punching bag, is he so perfect? Is, let's just say he prides himself on his marriage and by his anniversary party, oh, he made everybody cry when he spoke about his wife. Yeah, really? You've never done anything that you feel is disloyal to your wife on some level? Not the, I'm not saying that people did anything terrible, but I'm saying on some level that you're so proud of every way you, the words you use to your wife every uh -huh. time. Would you want me to expose your worst moment when I overheard you in the pizza shop the way you said to your wife, uh -huh. so impatient? No, because that's not you. So that, that's not him. Why can't you understand the same thing? Why are they the ones that you suddenly pull? No, I'm not a Rebbe Levi Yitzchak of uh, Yeshiva Bechem. I'm just a realist about who is the future of Kali Yisrael, who's our greatest national asset, and and where we're headed. They're, they're, they're the people. Can, can I ask you a question? I've never asked you about this. This might be the most modern Orthodox question I ever, ever ask. But I'm, I'm genuinely curious what you specifically have to say. Do you ever worry that we have so many assets for self-expression and for, you know, like publicly shining a light, especially in the yeshiva world, on, on the exact yeshiva guy you're talking about, I'm not talking about the star A student, and we haven't yet, I feel like, mastered or uncovered, or maybe there's a disparity, which you may not agree with, with, with women in the yeshiva world. Do you think, I'm like... I'm not getting the question. Meaning, like, I feel like there, there, there's so many great ways, like the kumzits, like the chevra get together, and, like, even if you're not like an a star person there are ways that you can feel like an ish so to speak um even if you're not like really at the center and i sometimes not, not i'm not like 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 super um i wonder i wonder if we have the same assets it could be i just don't know and the answer is like yes there are like the same type of like chavaya those like inspirational get-togethers and the ways that people do it when in 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 like that post-seminary World for so women. It's funny you're asking that. I think I, I find that I have, I have an, another issue with, I mean, the girls are getting that for sure. The Javier, they're getting. They're, they're getting the, the color wars and the comes at yeah. Most of the girls' schools that I, know, I, only, I only know. I'm talking about like in your 20s. Like, uh, oh, you mean that they're not getting the Febrang and the Yeah, the like that's what I worry about sometimes. Uh, your, your you friend, know what I mean? One of the, one of the, really, one of the contemporary great Jewish leaders, uh, Moshe Bain, told me when he, he's leaving the OU and he's looking. Yeah. He's a man with a tremendous drive to do for Kali Yisrael, sure. and certainly the, the brilliance and the, the determination to get it done. Yeah. And, and this is one of his things. The, the women in their 20s and 30s are not yeah. connecting at an emotional level. They're not getting that same. Yeah. That same, it's, 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 it's great. It's, it's a very hard thing to implement, you know, because a man is not going to lead a, a, a comes as forward. Correct. If a woman's going to do that, she's a little bit branded as yeah. like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. a little... Uh, it's hard. No, it's something I think about in a lot. Like, I feel like what you've created in that 20s, 30s yeshiva guy culture, it's not, it's not a criticism on you. I don't, I'm not asking you to do it. Very much. I just wonder if it's a disparity that you ever like, oh, sh yeah, I, I, I hope this, there is sure. a, a Rebbitzin Besser, so to speak, like somebody who's doing this, what you do for... It's, 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 a, again, I, I don't, I can't tell you I'm up to date. Yeah. I also don't like people answer, like, unpacked. People say, oh, I think about that all the time. I don't think about it all the time. I think about it all the time back to carpool who's picking, yeah. picking up my kid and who's, you know. Yeah. But it's a question I've thought about for yeah. sure. Something interesting, I got this from Abshlema, was the first place I saw it. Abshlema had this thing. He said that there was a year of Lubavitch Chassan named Rab Zalman Yudkin. Abshlema was enamored of him. He had been in Russia mm -hmm. all the years and he would come collecting. And he would come to Montreal and stay by my parents as well. Abshlema, when he was in five towns, he stayed by Abshlema. And Rabbi Shlomo said, how did, you, how did you survive in Russia all those years? So he said, meaning there's no such thing as men being inspired and coming home and bringing. That doesn't work. If a man hears something inspiring and comes up and brings it to the Shabbos table, 
forget about it. Families have to be inspired together. So Shlomo created something in, in their Chayashev. You, they had a bungalow colony. Nice yeah. Dasha, the first. Those Yeshiva early Shayesha families are special. They, they went up. It was the first 12 to 18 families. Yeah. They made a bungalow colony. Because remember, Rabbi Shlaima sat there every single night. There's videos around mm-hmm. Rabbi Shlaima and Shlaima was on playing guitar. And the people, and I, I wouldn't say men and women are in a circle, but the women were very much part of the thing. Shlaima treated them like daughters. And the 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 way that you're seeing that, I can't speak for other communities, out of town for sure, the shuls are much more family-centered than they ever used to be. That means my own shul. Is it more so now? Much more. My, my shuls are, I would say, Typical Haredi yeshiva shashul. We have sudas, Shabbos sudas, the whole show. We together. go away for Shabbos, the hotel, the whole show goes away to Shabbos together. And and that's not typical, right? Is it, do, do, do you see that in in I, I don't like know Lakewood, people Brooklyn, in Lakewood, Brooklyn, the tri-state area? Know, like like a shul that would to do that. It's probably yeah. considered Haredish. Yeah. It's, um, it, it would it would take you know my wife has, has the confidence, and we live out of town. And takes and the whole shul to The whole shul goes. You never told me that. That's the whole shul goes to hotel every second year. We switch off. One year, it's always Pasha Zachar around. So it's yeah. either in the shul or, you know, it's expensive. So it's every second year. The kids live for it. This is interesting. The boys, uh, teenage boys and girls don't go. That means up till certain age. Uh-huh. Thing, because that, the Rav said, that, that is something. For modesty reasons. Small, right? Yeah. So some years it's the boys and then. No, it's the girls, and the Rav goes away alone with the boys for Shabbos. Wow. That's, you know, the teenage boys don't go. They stay back, and they eat by their Rebbe, and we take care of that they should have a nice Shabbos Montreal. And then he went away alone with the boys for Shabbos, just them and the Rav to, to come. Yeah. So they had a much better Shabbos, obviously. But it, it's very important that people grow together with their families. That means how should, why should a wife, net, that doesn't mean that every Shabbos the wife is hearing the Rav. But when her husband comes home, at least she understands who he is. And I, I would think that most of the Rabbanim, I'm not up to date on numbers, but most of the active, relevant Haredi Rabbanim I know are very much engaged in the women's programming, either through their wives or through other people or through they, they themselves. My wife speaks to women every second Travis. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm curious on, 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 got that. on this topic. You know, you run this account um, on social media. You know, you write books, you write columns a little less frequently now for Mishpacha magazine. But you, you, you used to be on social media, then you stepped away, then you came back, you run this account called MKY Mika Amcha Yisrael. And I'm curious, it, it, it's very beautiful, um, even if you were still allowed to tease it or, uh, quietly, but, but sometimes tease. And, but I, I, I love it, I find it very moving. I, I always try to share when I, you know, certain things that pull up my heartstrings. But I'm curious, how did you build it up that you became so central? I, I, I feel like when I found out you live in Montreal, I was like, so how do you stay so in the know? Like you're, is it still a deliberate decision that you Dafka specifically don't live in the tri-state area, Lakewood, Brooklyn? That, Very much. What, what are the freedoms that living outside of it give you that you would feel like you wouldn't be able to do had you lived in, you know, a more centrally located community? Uh, first of all, the, uh, um, we're sitting in Muncie now. Yeah. I was in the this morning. And the guy stopped me. He's like, look at my talus bag. And he's like, uh, are you a best or you're from the magazine? So whatever, whatever. I said, whatever. I said, he'll say, I, 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 I need you for a minute. I have to tell you something. I'm very upset about something. The tuition process for the acceptance for the seminary, they took it for whatever the thing. Yeah. I mean, I said, it's not a great time. I, you know, maybe send the email or whatever thing I say. Um, Montreal, nobody could care less. They just see Charlie Bass. I don't, couldn't care less about what I do do, what I don't do, what I do. They don't even know a lot of them. The older Hungarian people say, what, do you write for Hamadia? Like, yeah. They don't really know. <laughs> your, your identity, when you live out of town in a small town, goes way back before whatever contemporary projects you've done. Yeah. You've done. So not only are you not different than anybody else, nobody's that excited to tell you their things. and to. So it's on a very practical level, much more peaceful. It's just people that could go to Charlotte just talk about the same things as everybody else. It's not that exciting here. Everybody has a lot, lot more people, Me- meaning there's a lot more people who maybe know who you are, or, you know, I, I'm not saying that people know who I are. My kids, my no, kids, but my they kids are. are funny. Yeah. They're, they're very funny. So we go like into, into the grocery store in the Caskills this week. So my son tells me how this is not Tati's man. Nobody knows who he is. He went through the whole store. <laughs> Tati's bummed out. Said, you know. um, but it comes with, with certain exposure, especially if you're a male yeah, in sure. media. So there's a lot of a lot of exposure, and I do the you know the our podcasts are on camera. So I send the people know, and everybody has their thing that they're waiting. But a lot of times they don't really care. They want to dump it by me like a shameless box, and then they're done. And now Besser should figure out what to do. So I let you know this problem. Then they go back and they tell the wife, told Besser about the tuition thing that we had, and he's going to do something. Yeah, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What? I'm not, what but that, that's, I, there's a lot of that here. There's also um, 
when you live in Montreal, you send your daughters to Beis Yaakov, there's a very good, not a very good chance, there's a 100% chance that someone in the class is going to be firmer than my daughter and they will not eat in our house because we don't keep Yashan. There's also a 100% chance that people will be, I don't want to say less firm, but less careful because we, we eat Chav as well. Yeah. And people don't. That means you're just exposing your children to such a, a wide, and, and guess what? They like them. They're good people, the Jews. This one was your lab partner and this one you went swimming with and this one's your friend. Yeah. And you learned a lot of different things about Yiddish guy that other people are not like you. So this one comes uh, Lubavitcher, Sephardi, Satima, home, whatever kind of home it is. That's not exactly like ours, but you got to see that these are uh, vibrant, healthy, beautiful Jewish families. And what a gift to give your kids that when they go out into the world to to to, to be able to nishmas Yisrael, to appreciate what Jews are. It happens to be a much more peaceful life at a town community. It's not only Montreal. That means on a very practical level, that means the, the whole, it's smaller and it's, uh, most of the women don't work at a town. It's not really like two jobs and two. No, you need much less. No, I always, I, I always find it peaceful hanging out with you. You, you, you exude that a little bit. I have a, a doesn't have that in town chaos. I have a Toyota Highlander. It's like a, a fancy car. Yeah. Montreal. It's Montreal's like a fancy car. Like I, got, <laughs> I gave him an And I don't care. I don't know that people in the town communities could so comfortably not have yeah. things. We, we have what we need. Uh, but there's no, the, I can't tell you that people make decisions based on how it's going to look economically. What will people think about yeah. me? It, it's a very peaceful life. It, it's another mode of my passions yeah. in town living. Now, I, I would push my kids to live in town. I'm not telling you that everybody has to live in town. My, yeah. my, when my daughter lives, I'm married. Well, you don't make like a thing me. out of it also. Yeah. It's not like you're like, it's not one of your like big issues. Whatever. If it works for you, that's great. Yeah. So my daughter asked me, my, you know, they, they live in like what I said, if your husband wanted to live out of town, I think that would be great if he, if that's something you felt. But if he loves Lakewood, that's also great. Lakewood's Lakewood. That means it's normal Jewish living in town. I don't mean Lakewood only, Lakewood, sure. whatever, whatever your in town is. I'm not saying that you can't create yeah. that yourself. You need a little more strength probably. It's very hard to not know where your kids are going to school until you get in. And I'm going to try to get your kid into kindergarten based on the one you choose because they both want you. There's two boys' schools and both, yeah. they both want you. And then you're done until he graduates high school. Well, let me ask you a question about, you know, topic selection. I've already had you for quite a bit of time. I don't want to take up so much more. I'm curious if there are biographies or topics that you, you have a, I don't, I don't know, call it, like a, almost like a Yitzhahara. You want to write about it, but you know, either because, you know, you, the, the figure is not Jewish or it's a period. It, it, it's not like your milieu. It's not your job that you're going to get hired by art school or by a film publisher to write about this. I'm curious if there are topics or personalities that like a part of you, if you had all the time in the world, you wish you could write about, but have never written about. In Jewish living or, or? Either one. I'm curious. Like, if, like for me, somebody once time asked me, like, if I could write, like, any biography, I've always wanted to write a biography on Gary Shanling. I've written about him. He was a comedian, a Jewish comedian. He wasn't affiliated observant. He had, like, a Jewish identity, but I'm very fascinated by his life. There's been documentaries on him. And, like, I, I, I said, like, I had all the time in the world. I have, like, part of me wants to write a biography on, on Gary Shanling. It's not what I'm writing. I write all that. I write, you know, we did the top five together. We did... Um, the, I'm, I'm writing now for on Dafyomi stuff, but like, I'm curious for you, are there topics that you cut? Are there people who fascinate yeah. me that if I could research them? All sorts. Jewish people and non-Jewish people? Yeah, I'm curious. All sorts. Who are people who fascinate me? Who you'd want to actually write about. A Gautol I would want to write about? Either one. Like, like, that would be if I could pick a book and it's never going to happen. Why is it never going to happen? It so wasn't the thing that the yeah. know, so David wasn't that keen on about yeah. being with him. Okay. I, I don't think it'll happen. That, that would be somebody. Yeah. And then Lahavda, Lahavda, I can't tell you that there's any any non Jews who fascinate me only because I, I don't have a lot of time. Yeah. There are a lot of writers who I read, like like a Chassid. You yeah. Know, I, there's writers, uh, some op ed writers like Peggy Noonan, who I, I read uh, c compulsively, and I, I'm constantly wishing I could share this with people. There were times in my life when I was. Uh, when uh, Carey Price was the Canadian's goalie, and year uh -huh. after year, I was just in awe of him. I don't know. I wanted to write a biography of him, but that would have been interesting. Probably to me at a certain period of my yeah. life to write a book on Carey Price. I I, I need to but say I this. Not... I need to say this because we're 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 winding down. I'm looking at the time, and I want to be careful. There's a very a very a really important thing that I want to say, um, and uh, I, I I've shared it with you before. Um, I don't think I've ever in person expressed my deepest hakar satov, my gratitude for, I really feel like you're the person who in a way, and I, I don't want you to take this as like you're, you're to blame. You're not to blame for anything that I've shared or said, but you're really the person who discovered me. Like if you were to ask what was my beginning of saying I have something to share to a wider audience, 
it was you reaching out to me and getting started on those top five columns that we did with Mishpacha Magazine together, and I eventually put out um, as a book. And like, I, I, when, I, when I look at that vart, when I look at that vart, you know, that we mentioned earlier about seeing, you know, people who are like a little tzibrachan, and I always look at myself as like a little bit tzibrachan, but looking at me with oh, kind of... mean? You're the most uh, opportunistic... Uh... Vulnerable person, I know. You never shy away using your vulnerabilities. Oh, you're right. I, I, I always teach you. I say, yeah. Jonathan, you're single till you're 30. Relax. <laughs> you don't become the expert on, on the, the pain of loneliness because you're single for four years. Uh, I, I tease you a lot about that. But, I, but I, I, I do know what you mean. You have an ability to convey your own. But you took a leap on me, meaning I didn't cover up the fact I wasn't a super yeshivish back then either. Um, and you took a real leap on me, and it's it's something that has stuck with me in many ways. I feel like my own story, your ability to see un, untapped stories, talent, people, individuals. I feel like you turned your gaze onto me, that you fey nine that you possess, uh, and it's something it's that I am. You to say that, and I, and I appreciate it. But besides that, you're making me uncomfortable. On a very <laughs> very track, I'm not. I'm not sure it's true. I, I saw your safer before I saw your writings, Berger, Zachem, Tiska. Yeah. I, I saw it. Menachem Butler introduced us. Yes. If you remember? And uh, there was, I, I knew you only from social media, and I, I thought you had a tone. You had a certain style that was very friendly and amiable and concealed a lot of depth. And I thought that somebody with those kind of talents provided that he has a Rebbe and he asks questions too, because I'm not somebody who yeah. can take that on my shoulders and about what to do with those talents is a tremendous asset to the Jewish people. I, I still believe that. Yeah, it, 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 meant a, it meant a great deal to me. And your writing, again, it, it still animates so much of what of what I do. You're making one of your really better uh, Zoom faces right now. Uh, so I know, I know I've, I've made you uncomfortable. Um, I always wrap up my interviews with more rapid fire questions. Do you want to do you want to talk out the expression you're making, or can we go into the rapid fires? I, I would much prefer to go into the rapid fire than okay. discuss my expressions with you. <laughs> if that's okay, a thousand percent. I, I am. I am. I'm wondering if you could, as uh, somebody who is an aspiring writer for the Jewish community, what books, either on writing itself or ways to model writing, would you recommend to somebody who is trying to hone their talents? They want to write uh, like op-ed pieces or fiction. Or biographies, I, I've done all. I write you, 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 fiction under a pen name as well. Correct, so I, correct. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what kind of writing they want to do. I think, um, the, the, not fiction, that's not what I had in mind. Like somebody, do, do you read books on writing itself? So, I, I read them all. I read yeah. them all. You know, I, I, when I started, I went on Amazon, and I bought so many books on writing. Yes. Didn't do that much for me. What I, what I learned to do is look, read great writers. And the more great writers you read, the better writer you'll become. So you'll pick your Peggy Noonan's, wherever that's going to be. Um, I don't, I don't know if, if uh, how your audience feels about the New York Times ideologically. I know that ideologically, most I think most Jews have, yeah. are uncomfortable with them. The writing is still unparalleled. I don't know if you're allowed to say that. It's the truth. It's a different level of writing. If you could make yeah. it a, a habit when you're able, I pay for an online subscription to the sure. New York Times till today. I'm telling my dad. I, yeah, and no, I understand. And I understand yeah. why. And yeah. I'm not you, I, I don't spend a lot of time reading. I'll talk, maybe yeah. once a week. I'll, I'll open it. But you, you read good writing, you become a better writer. You you know, sometimes I hear a phrase that just makes me smile or a way to convey things. I have good friends who are writers who share, we share a lot the Atlantic. We When we see writers that we like, that's really the only way to be a good writer is to re keep reading. And then there's a lot of firm writers who have who are just phenomenal writers, who have people like in the world of, I'm not, I'm not so, uh, I don't have to pretend like I don't read from writers to yeah. feel like I'm intellectual. I, I've gained a lot from reading Jonathan Rosenblum's columns, sure. uh, Ethan Kobe's columns, and uh, Rabbi Yaakov Joseph Reinman. He was straight on uh, the penny, mountain of gold. Probably the most uh, brilliant, right? One of the level kind. Of, of brilliance. I, you know, I, I would just feel humble. There, there's so many uh, from writers who, who, the Sarah Shapiro. Where I read their stuff, and I would just say, "Wow!" I, I would be breathless. Um, I'm curious. I always, I always wonder if somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical to go back to school to get a PhD, whatever topic that you wanted. What do you think the subject and title of your dissertation would be? Exactly what I'm doing with MKY. You mentioned that earlier. I, I want uh, MKY is not a, a news platform. I think that there's a need for from news platforms. I'm not here to tell you news. I'm not here to tell you about Putin, and I'm not here to tell you about who's winning with uh, Biden's son or what's going on in Israel. Look around. Stop your Jew. Your eyes have to be different. What you see has to be different. And just take a look around you at everybody you know. 
your friends, your neighbors, your roommates, your wife, your kids, your husband, your spouse, your parents, your kids, and look at the glory of what it means to be on a regular day from washing Nagel Vasa in the morning until you close your eyes at night. If you say I'm apple, if you don't say I'm apple. The, there's nobody who takes the time because we just we're on a conveyor belt running 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 and nobody takes the time to just to say have you so you mentioned them correct so i'm saying take a minute so whatsapp status please primarily at this point not in print it's not a website it just started as a whatsapp status something i with vision not not a not a business not for profit and i just i fell in love with this concept i had a little more time than you know when i okay why again me Kam, so, so who is like you the jewish people sign up i could tell you the number to sign up is that oh, okay? you text me after I'll put it in the intro now Joe. amazing um, and you just sign up and people go can I a few things let's let's use Lubavitch for an example a lot yeah. of people don't don't like Lubavitch for whatever reason their, their issues are ideological they're yeah. like it. You, you you have to sometimes stop and say wow these shulchan live wherever they live just so that, yeah. to bring Yiddishkeit let's say you're not a big fan of, of uh, Tzahal of Israeli soldiers yeah you have to stop and say these people are putting the line their lives on the line of the end and, and look at how he happens before he goes and then then of course the yeshiva world that means the, the BMG, you're able to pause the kind of the ideological wars you're thinking you're 34 years old shouldn't you get a job shouldn't you do something yeah. productive and anything Look what he's doing. It's 11.30 in the morning and all he cares about is the Diak and Rashi and Chartal. How, yeah. Why does Rashi have, why yeah. does Rashi say, look at these people. Take, and this is all of us. It's, if you don't, you're cheating right. yourself out of your birthday. You think the Rav Shalom and all the billions of people had this tiny little nation and in that nation, a tiny little minute amount of people, this this little tiny speck of, of, of amount of people who actually had such a thing called the Rav Shalom, you think he put us here not to contemplate how lucky we are? We, we, we should walk around feeling like we have a winning lottery ticket. Uh -huh. Now, I know that life isn't always easy. And I know that you don't just walk around and jump up and down and, and, sure. and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, break dance to thank you, Hashem, a whole day. It doesn't work that way. But realize what you're part of. Realize it's not only we do a lot of the anytime a front person pulls over at the side of the road, yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 guys, and a lot of that joy of the Mincha people. But which which speaks to a different need for Jewish unity and what people yeah. are really looking for, and that there's no such thing as a firm person in trouble in a hospital or whatever who doesn't have an instant network of family. Yeah, who's there? It, it not only makes you a better person because what happens is you start thinking, "Hey, I should do that you. too. I should start doing. I should start doing that too." It, it it also puts you in a much better frame of mind, and and it makes everything much easier when you it, it restores the peace in your soul. When you realize, okay, three thousand three hundred and whatever years after Har Sinai. I just want people to realize that. The one that stresses me out the most, I just need to let you know, I love them all, I share them all. The one that stresses me out the most is when you show videos of early morning kolels at like 6.30 in the morning and it's packed. I'm like, Surly, what are you doing to me? Like, could you... Show the videos at, at 9, 9.30. I, I, I don't... Re so here's the thing. I'm like me. you. So a few things. First of all, a lot of it is trolling. MKY is 90% inspiration, 10% trolling. Yeah. Whoever, whoever were trolling that day. <laughs> Second of all, uh, a gentleman called us up, follower of MKY. He yeah. wants to open that in London. He flew to Lakewood. Yeah. He flew it in the Lutz Shoal in Lakewood. Yeah. And it's called Kyle by Karishmol. Met the head, five-ish waxman. He sat in for a day, watched it, and he brought his thing back. And they're doing it. From Very MKY. stresses me out, maybe. I'm sorry. It's so it's special. I, I apologize. Uh, um, you know, you should know, first of all, that you always have a safe space with me. So right now, if you want... Look at, like, <laughs> I want opportunistic to help, vulnerability. Right, no, no, no. I'm sorry that you feel... I'm sorry that you feel <laughs> challenged. But, but the MKY people... Everyone, every Jew has their thing they can do. Not everybody can yeah. security. But maybe you could make uh, cakes for people. Maybe you could be... Whatever. People look at MKY and they say, that's me. I could do that. Yeah. So it's just this community of people. And I... I by me, the Jews that we celebrate means Shochan Aruch Jews. Doesn't really mean doesn't mean what color hat you wear, what kind yeah. of hair. It's if you believe in the basic things that we believe in and keep the things we keep, sure. then, then you're then you're my guy. And and we do our best to create. That's if I could. If somebody gave me a lot of money to do something, I would put my life into into just playing the theme song of Ashrenu Matayv Chalkenu again and again and again all day. I, I, I think that's a big part of what you're doing. My last question, which I'm always fascinated why, because of my opportunistic vulnerabilities about being able to get out of bed in the morning. I'm always curious about people's sleep schedules. What time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? The truth? The truth. I go to sleep at about three. I'm up by seven, 10 to seven. For real? Mm -hmm. You go to sleep so late? Mm -hmm. Do you not need so much sleep? So uh, you nap during I, the day, you're a day napper. Day. It's a thing I get. I take a lot of abuse for. Uh -huh. There's another thing I did. We didn't come up. It's a thing that the same people who bother me. I get bothered. I don't talk on the phone. Uh -huh. I think maybe we discussed yeah, this once. Yeah, yeah. I don't talk on the phone because it's. It, I'm not embarrassed about it. It sounds like a jerk. You know, I don't yeah. talk on the phone. People say I called you. I left you a message. I, I feel bad. The nature of what I do is 
you know, you understand your father's a doctor. Could you understand that if he goes into surgery, he leaves his phone outside? Yeah. The nature of a writer, especially if you're ADHD, my own uh, opportunistic vulnerability moment, and one distraction throws you out for a whole day. You need to be completely zoned into it, as you know. Yeah. You know, we, we've sure. commiserated with each other sure. nights before deadlines, looking at yeah. the screen and feeling like you, yeah. uh, you want to break it. So I, I work a lot of hours a day, and then, but then I have to read a lot. Because yeah. just sure. even for the stuff I'm busy with. So I go into bed at night, usually not before 1, 1.30. I have at least an hour of stuff I need to just get to just for the next day. Yeah. And then MKY, which I said is it's not for profit. That It's taken, it's, it's stolen. It takes, it takes time. Stolen. No, Berkshire, we have a team. You know, okay. I do, oh, I do, great. At this point, I, I, you know, Berkshire, we hired a girl. Who oh, amazing. Who all the phones amazing. and the submissions and the incoming stuff and gets back to people. And I have partners as well. Some who deal with, with the business end of it. And sure. Some who deal with the graphics. Baruch Hashem. But the content is still my problem and what and how to tell these stories. Yeah. So that right before I go to sleep at night, I want the morning batch. I, I don't post myself. So a lot of times I'm not up yet. Gotcha. If it's up at seven. Yeah. You know, we have we, we have someone who does that for us. You know, so she's she's already, I want her to have it when she wakes up. Gotcha. So that, that took the last, uh, you know, hour of my nights. So then I don't sleep very much at night. And it's my day, day I sleep for like 45 minutes an hour. It's the only way I could do it. So I, I, lo- I love, I love a day nap. It's my favorite, my favorite Rev Hutner story. <laughs> I, I heard this from uh, Simcha Lyons that Rav Huttner was one time talking to one of his, you know, newly minted students who was a Rav in a shul. And the Rav Huttner asked him, what's your relationship like with your Balabatim, with the people who in your shul? And I don't know, how am I supposed to know? How am I supposed to know? Rav Huttner said, when you take a nap, do you take a nap wearing pants or not without pants? That's what Rav Huttner said, meaning... Take a nap without pants, meaning it means that, like, you're about to give you a little bit of slack and you get up. You're sleeping with your suit on, that means it, it's not a good, it's not a good thing. Excellent. Rebs, really, I cannot thank you enough for the time today, for all of, really, your friendship, your effort, your guidance, everything that you do, have done and do for me. It means so much to me. It's a pleasure. But besides, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice to see how you are motivated to use your, your communication skills and your understanding of people to benefit Clyde as well. It's also heartening to see that you are, I don't, I don't like the way you're portraying our relationship as a little muscle giver on your shoulder. <laughs> you. but the ability that we can talk things about honestly. Yes. That, that always, that it's nice to have people that you could talk to and say, and, and say things to. I appreciate it. that to me is the real sign of friendship people. So it's an office to say. Thank you. Thank you, Absurly. It is hard to point to one piece of writing from somebody who is so prolific uh, and kind of recommend it. Everybody's going to find their own piece that sticks with them. But I can really say with great confidence that the writing of Sruli Besser is a jewel in the Jewish community. Uh, he's somebody who you should be acquainted with. Uh, if you've never read anything of his, personally, I would tell you to start with his biography on Rib Shlomo Freifeld, who's the founder of Shar Yashav, or the biography that he wrote on Rev Mayer Zlatowicz, who founded Art Scroll, uh, both of which are fantastic. His Haggadah, the Milach Biederman Haggadah, uh, was a bestseller. I'm sure many of our listeners already have it, but they're both they're both absolutely fantastic. I want to leave you kind of with two words of his writing, one of which I've already shared at least once. I know I think I shared it last year, uh, literally in the books, books, book series. It was written, the words are up from Shirley Besser. I want to reshare it, and then I want to share one other thing that he's written, uh, that really stays with me uh, to this very day and brings us back to what I think truly in many ways represents and what I think we all strive to represent within the communities that we're affiliated with. The first story is one that I mentioned uh, last year, but I want to read it again because I think about it constantly. I'm going to read directly because it's Shirley's words from the biography of Rev. Mayor Zlotowicz. He writes about Ramirez Ladowitz, who's really world-renowned for starting Art Scroll, the greatest book revolution that, I don't know, in the Jewish world that we've had in the last hundred years. And people didn't really know this before the biography outside of family, but Ramirez Ladowitz had a very painful divorce early in his life, and his kids ended up living with him. And it was something that really stayed with him. Uh, And he wrote as follows, in 1971, he and his wife divorced. It was an era when divorce was virtually unheard of in the community before the support networks that would be available years later existed. He was alone, a young father charged with the care of three young children, faced with a much heavier burden than a floundering business. It was a difficult time, but later he would point out that period of time of blessing 
because it was then that he developed the faith, resilience, and optimism that would allow him not just to succeed, but also to encourage others. Throughout his life, he would seek out those facing difficulties and reassure them that better days would come. And he would say he was speaking from experience. At the darkest point, the flicker of light that ushered in the brighter days from the most radiant man in Rav Meir's lot or his world, his Rebbe, Rav Moshe Feinstein. It came at a time when Rav Meir felt he had hit rock bottom. The business was in debt, he was raising three children on his own, and his friends were busy with their own lives while he was alone. He wasn't able to learn properly since after long, wearying days at work, he would come home and take care of his children. He went to Rav Moshe's Lower East Side apartment, waiting in the familiar foyer for a chance to share his pain with his beloved Rosh Hashiva. But Rav Moshe was meeting with a group of Rabbanim involved in a complicated halachic issue. And after Rav Meir sat there waiting for a long while, the Rebbitzin came out and apologized. The Rosh Hashiva wouldn't be able to see him after all. Reb Meir was despondent. Even this, it seemed, the opportunity to unburden himself to his Rebbe was being denied to him. He returned home, the load feeling heavier than ever before. The next day, New York suffered major snowstorms, making car travel difficult. Schools were closed, and Reb Meir spent the day at home watching his young children. That evening, as he... Harry, young father, struggled to get the children to bed. The doorbell rang. Rev. Mayer walked downstairs and opened the door, wondering who would have ventured out on the snowy night. It was Rev. Moshe Feinstein, the Rosh Hashiva, hosek of his generation and leader of thousands, accompanied his Talmud up several flights of stairs, coming into the apartment and taking in the scene. Rav Moshe lifted one child, then the next, and finally the third one. He tucked each one into bed, telling them a story and kissing them goodnight. Then when the house was settled, Rav Moshe looked at Rav Meir. I came to Shmooz to hear what's on your mind. I-, I have a hard time reading this story without getting choked up, aside from my um, reverence for Rav Moshe Feinstein and my appreciation of Rav Meir Zlotowicz, just the scene and the writing or Rav Struli Besser um, in taking this really difficult time and sharing it in a way that almost asks the reader, who could you be and who could you serve in this role in your own life is something that has always stuck with me. The image of opening up the door, God forbid, after going through something so difficult like Rav Zlotowicz in divorce and opening up the door on a snowy day and seeing the leader of the Jewish people, Rav Moshe Feinstein, sitting outside is something that I have a hard time reading, really, without getting extraordinarily emotional. And I think in, in a lot of ways, this story encapsulates not just the greatness of Rav Moshe Feinstein, not just the encouragement that continued with Rav Meir Zlotowitz, but in a lot of ways, uh, Sruli Besser. Um, he has showed up uh, in my life uh, in times where I really needed it. Maybe he didn't know it. Uh, and he was there. It wasn't actually snowing outside, uh, but he was there to tell somebody uh, in their in their 20s who was a little bit lost, who was a little bit curious, what's next, what's going to be with me? And he showed up and he said, you're worth it. You're, you, you, you have something to contribute. And it's really this final Torah that I want to share with you directly from the writings of Rasruli Besser that I think encapsulates everything. Um, and everything, I, I don't mean to talk, and Surly will kill me for sharing this about him. Uh, so let's stop talking about Surly Besser. He's gonna not just he's not gonna kill me. He's gonna make fun of me, obviously, uh, which is normally how we correspond. Um, makes fun of me with love, with great, with great love. But he's very good at it. He's very good at it. He's the one who told me that only modern Orthodox people use the term shiva call, paying a shiva call. Um, which is the term that I've always used. I, I told him, I, I, we were scheduling, I said, oh, I have to pay a shivakal. He says, only modern Orthodox people say pay a shivakal. He says, we use the, the, the Yiddishkeit term, the he, the, the Hebrew term to be Menachem Avel, to, to comfort those in mourning. Um, I, he just has, has a very, very sharp eye. And it's this last idea that I want to leave our listeners with because it means so much to me. It's, I repeated it nonstop. I'm not going to apologize for repeating it again because it's so beautiful. It's from the biography of Rub Shlomo Freifeld. 
You can find this on page 141, and he writes as follows. He's talking to a student over Shlomo Freifeld, where he says, My Rebbe was a giant among men. I once heard him tell someone, how can you speak about yourself that way? It wasn't a shallow statement. It was a highly emotional reaction. This morning, I understood this as a mafteach, an opening to what Lush and Hara is. People see themselves with negativity, with an eye in ra, so they speak badly of themselves and eventually about everything around them. I know people who are so talented, yet all they can say about themselves is, ah, I want to share with you a vart from the Alexander Rebbe. This is the vart that Shlomo Freifeld said, where he said, and I'm reading directly from Srili Besser, if you travel 10,000 miles just to hear this vart, it's worth it. The Pusuk in Shmuel Aleph, and we said this on the podcast, but I want to read it directly from the book. The Pusuk in Shmuel Aleph, it's in the 22nd chapter, it's the second Pusuk, you want to look it up, uh, the, the, again, 22nd chapter, second verse, Pasuk, uh, tells us about the unstable period before David HaMelech became king. He was running and hid out in the cave of Adullam. Some men gathered around him. That was his gang. You know who? And he quotes the Pasuk, Vayizkapsu a love, kol ish matzo, v'kol ish asher lo nosei, v'kol ish mar nefesh, an ish matzuk, a man in distress. Everything he touches turns sour. Ish asher lo nosa, a man with a creditor. He's bankrupt and people are running after him. Ish mar nefesh, a man with embittered spirit. He's trampled on. It's not even his own fault. He never had a happy day in his life. Do you know what David Amelech did? He called each one of them ish, a man, a person. He was the Libo Shalkol Yisroel, the heart of every Jew. He saw into the panemius, what was inside, beyond the outer circumstances, past the falsehood. He saw that each person was an ish. He was a Yefei Enayim, which literally means had beautiful eyes. And Rav Shuli writes, do you think that means that he had blue eyes? It means that he had a good pair of eyes. He knew how to see. And I think about this idea from the Alexander Rebbe that was told to her, that was told over by Rabbi Shalom Freifeld and later kind of memorialized in this beautiful biography about the people in our lives who are matzuk, who are in distress, who are mar nefesh, who are embittered spirit. And what we can do in the way we speak to them and the way we talk to them and the way that we share their story to give them that sense of being an ish, of having dignity, of having decency in their own lives. And of course, ish in this context doesn't mean gender, man, woman. Ish means a, a person with dignity, a person with esteem, that they can look in the mirror and say, no matter what I'm going through, my life has purpose, my life is worthwhile. And in order to do this, this is, the, this is what great writers do. They have Yisei Einayin, they have beautiful eyes. The way that they see other people's stories, the way they share other people's stories is with a beauty, is with an, an upliftedness that they're able to share and inspire. And I think particularly during these times of the three weeks where we focus so much on how to mend and heal those fissures that we have in our lives, whether they're in our family lives, whether it's the, the reflection that we see in the mirror, or our relationship to our community, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to God, so much of what heals that relationship is learning how to cultivate and develop Yifet in I am beautiful eyes. And of course, that doesn't mean wearing blue contacts. It means having a good pair of eyes, knowing how to see, knowing how to see others, knowing how to see our friends, knowing how to see our family, knowing how to see our community, our community leaders, and knowing how to see people who are going through distress, who have embittered spirit, having the eyes and the capacity to uplift is something that I learned uh, from people like Srili, but we're not talking about Srili anymore. We're talking about us. And particularly in these times, having that Yefet Enayim, those beautiful eyes that are able to uplift and able to tell somebody, even when they're reaching into the bag and nothing's coming out, keep reaching, even somebody who's going through the worst time in their life and they open up the door on a snowy day. And it's not just Rav Moshe Feinstein that they see there, but it could be us. It could be us. It could be our listeners. It could be, it could be the Jewish community of showing up and uplifting and looking at one another 
with those yifet inai and those beautiful eyes that hopefully will also merit to see some taste of redemption in the world before us. So thank you so much for listening. This episode was edited by our friend Rob, who's taking over while our normal editor, Dina, is on vacation. We're wishing Dina a great vacation. We definitely miss you. It wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any of our episodes, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. You can also leave us a voicemail with feedback or questions that we may play in a future episode. That number, of course, is 917-720-5629. Once again, that number is 917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y dot org, where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. Thank you so much for listening, and stay curious, my friends.